If this video goes out on time, which it might not, it should be the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landings. I thought I would commemorate the occasion by writing a very simple lunar landing game on my new compiler. And what better hardware to actually run a lunar landing game on than an actual lunar lander? Now, I say an actual lunar lander, but I don't actually have one. There's only like one left and it's in deep space. But I do have Virtual AGC, which is a superb simulation of the Apollo guidance computer used by the, uh, the LEM, the lander itself, and also by the command module. They made, I think, 75 of these, and all but two are now defunct. Quite a lot of them crashed into the moon. Some of them crashed into the Earth. One of them is floating in deep space. One of them has been lovingly restored and is now running for real. And all the rest are non-functional parts in museums. The Apollo guidance computer itself was a massive 40 kilogram chunk of material, mostly handmade. It made out of discrete logic components, uh, integrated circuits, very early ones, all hand wired together using wire wrapping. It did not have a uh, silicon memory. It used core, magnetic core RAM. This is a section of magnetic core rope, a variant of the technology used for the ROM. So this is non-volatile. Um, I don't have a picture of the actual RAM itself. It was a fascinating, incredibly expensive and utterly bizarre machine, and it is going to be fun to port to. If you're used to modern computers, the AGC is like the weirdest thing ever. Computers were different back then, and they hadn't settled on the architecture used by modern machines. So we have, you know, 8-bit bytes. The AGC used 15-bit words, except when it didn't. Some of, sometimes it used 16-bit words. Uh, we have computers with registers. The AGC didn't really. Depending how you count, it either has hundreds or three or none. Modern computers use two's complement arithmetic. The AGC didn't. The AGC used one's complement arithmetic, except when it didn't and used two's complement arithmetic. Modern computers run at a fixed clock rate. The AGC didn't. A lot of the logic was written using asynchronous logic, and it just sort of ran at a, an approximate speed. It just got on with stuff until the logic was done. An instruction will be documented as taking, you know, about 23 microseconds. And the instruction set itself is utterly bizarre. I've gone through it and it's got all the bits I need to make my compiler work, but I am actually doing this for real. This is not a rigged thing. I haven't done any of the work yet. I've put together a skeleton compiler code generator. See, no code. And I'm just gonna fill stuff out. So this is going to be a learning experience for like everybody. Oh yes, I should also mention that Modern computers have, like, display terminals. The AGC had this. This is a disky. It's the I.O. device used that the astronauts uh, communicated with the computer. They would type in commands using the keypad here and read the result here. The only way the computer had of talking to them was flashing lights and showing numbers. Yeah, uh, the, the AGC did not do text. Like, not at all. There is no ASCII in the binary, ever. Everything is done using numbers. So, I suppose we should better get started. So, our compiler. Well, I wrote this thing in under a week. I mean, literally, I did the prototype on video on Saturday. Uh, so, I've done a ton of work on it since then, so I've factored out all the code generation stuff, but it's still pretty cheap and shoddy and full of bugs. So this is going to be a bit of a learning experience. 
Uh, in fact, this morning I had an insight which would allow me to drastically simplify, make it faster, flexible, easier to understand, and more and produce better code. But I haven't had a chance to do that yet, so what you see is what we got. So we might as well get started, I suppose. Okay. So we build the program. Uh, that's built the compiler. And we've got a test program, which is test.cal here, which is empty. And I can run it, run the compiler, and it fails, of course. Now, uh, I don't want to load that one. I want to load that one. Our compiler is going to generate assembly code that we're going to feed into a assembler called Yayul. This is a modern replica of the original Yule assembler written in 1959, which read programs off punched cards and during an overnight assembly job would produce a binary that people would then have to hand weave into this stuff. Uh, they did actually have like core rope simulators, so you could develop without doing that. Yayul is a pretty close replica of the original. Uh, it takes the same syntax. Its intended purpose is to be able to read the original source code for Luminary and Colossus, the two programs used by the LEM and the command module, and turn them into uh, binaries that we can tell are the same as the ones that were loaded into the actual computers of the day. So the uh, syntax is somewhat archaic and we're limited to stuff like, you know, eight character identifiers and there isn't a linker and lots of really weird stuff. So we're going to have to work around some of that. I have put together a skeleton program, which is this. Uh, this contains things like the, uh, the interrupt initialization code, the code to nerf the watchdog timer, which interestingly they called the night watchman back then. What this does is it repeatedly checks uh, this, uh, it checks to see if this memory location has been read from, and if it hasn't, it assumes the computer's crashed and resets it. And we don't really care about that, so uh, we use one of the timers to uh, just read from it periodically. So we use Yayul to uh, assemble our machine code. This then produces a binary file you know, 74k, that's how big it was. And we can show you the hex. It's, you know, not much for a program. And we then run that in the emulator. So the first thing we're going to have to do then is to write out these two files. This is a modern extension to Yayul, which allows include files, and that's so, so useful. So what we're going to do is um, code file, data file, Let's do that way around. And this is going to be a bodge job, so um, cow.data.agc cow.code.agc And we don't actually need to do any other work here just yet because our skeleton does it all for us. And we'll get onto the actually interesting bit in a moment. So, okay, that has actually failed a bit further on, which is just what we want. And it should have generated a blank da data file and a blank code file, which is good. Okay, now what we're going to do first is we're going to try and assemble and run this program which is empty. This will give us the minimum viable product for a compiler, and then we go and add features to that. Uh, I do not actually need my 8080, 
code generator anymore. So let's just close that. So this seems to be a good time to talk about the ISA because we're about to have to start touching it. From my perspective as a modern application writer, the AGC has three registers known as A, uh, A L and Q. There's a fourth register Z, which is the program counter, but that's internally. The registers are in fact all memory mapped. So A is at address zero, L is at address one, and Q is at address two. Uh, there's, uh, these are special in that they are 16 bits wide rather than 15, which the rest of the system is. They uses the 16th bit to check for overflows. Now there are lots more registers, but I'm just going to think of those as being memory mapped IO. The computer does not have anything resembling a stack pointer. Now that's fine because Calgol, the language which I am actually compiling here, uh, forbids recursion. So we know that functions will not be called re-entrantly and therefore uh, we don't need a dynamic stack at all. We, they, each function's workspace can be statically allocated in memory, which is very useful. So, what do we do when we enter a subroutine? Well, this is where the queue register comes in. The, uh, the, the AGC opcode for calling subroutines is TC. And what this does is it pushes, pushes, thinking about too, thinking about stacks too much. It puts, puts the return address into the queue register. And then the return instruction jumps to the address in the queue register. I believe that the original authors just didn't use nested subroutines very much. However, we are, so what we're going to have to do is in our prologue, save the queue register into memory. And then in the epilogue, load the return address out of memory into the queue register and then do the return. To do this, we are going to have to start emitting code. So we are going to write a, uh, a simple function to actually emit things. And I'm going to steal this. So this is going to be emit data. Actually, do I want to do that? No, I don't. I can just use printf. I don't need that at all. So the prologue is going to be uh, well, we're going to need to emit a label for the subroutine itself. So something like we're then going to need to emit the code to um, save the queue register. And uh, I was just thinking that the Yule syntax has uh, labels left justified and code justified in. So rather than actually put lots of Bases in, I'm actually just going to do define code uh, pen space. Just do that. So I can do, if this is code, I can just say, uh, so you want to store Q in the return address now. The instruction to store, there is, there are several, they're all weird. So TS, transfer to storage. TS writes A, the accumulator, into memory location. It's also a jump instruction. If A, which remember is a 16-bit register because it's got an overflow bit, if A overflows, 
it skips the instruction after the TS. So this is supposed to allow you to do stuff like uh, TS var uh, TCF transfer control to fixed address. That's a jump instruction. It's, it's supposed to. Hang on, have I got that backwards? No, this would actually be much more sensible. This allows you to do this. Which, to be honest, I find a slightly odd way around to doing it. Now, I don't care at all about overflow, but I do care about the code randomly skipping instructions. So I'm going to have to be really careful when I use TS that I haven't just done arithmetic, because if I've done arithmetic, the overflow bit might be set, and therefore it might skip the next instruction. So yeah. However, we can't use this here because TS only stores the A register. So in fact, we are going to use, uh, what's it called, Q exchange. Q exchange, if I can actually find it, swaps the value of Q with the value in a memory location. Now this will corrupt Q, but we don't actually care about that. So, we say Q exchange turn storage. And then here in our uh, epilogue, we're going to do uh, Q exchange return storage. Return. Like so. Um, and in fact, I hate this. I'm going to go back to my original plan. And I'm going to put in some helper functions. Uh, F print F, this is code, so code FP. Uh, Yeah, printf code fp s app e label which should be exactly the same but without the uh, the indentation put some new lines in too and e data Now, e data is going to be slightly different because all data values will be a label and then an instruction. So we're actually going to do uh, f data f p. Um, trying to remember how to do left justified strings. Let's try that and see what happens. Okay, so now our code here can be simply emit label label emit code view exchange return storage. And e code q exchange return storage. Turn. All right. That does not work because right. Okay, 
So what has this produced for our code? That wasn't quite what I expected. Okay, 20 is way too much. Uh, Oh, no, no, this has actually worked. So what we are seeing is one side. So that's a compiler bug. I think I did a bad merge. I don't want that there. And I also call in prologue twice. Uh... Oh no, I'm not. I'm ah yes, that is actually correct. So what we've got is the subroutine label. We save the we save queue to return storage. We load queue from return storage and we return. So that is working. Now we now need to actually emit the appropriate label. So that is actually just current sub name. And we stick a leading underscore on it just to Disambiguate it. Okay. You're going to have to be careful in the code because in our programs because we have to keep it under seven letters. We'll uh, deal with that in a moment. But now we need to allocate some data. So this will happen in the epilogue. We say. Emit data. Yeah, I have in fact. This is just this is screwed up. We actually want uh, we actually want all the same stuff here. Yeah, that's, that's ugly. We can fix the names in a moment. So e data label return storage e data arrays. Now, arrays is a special instruction that causes uh, the assembler to skip one word. Uh, we just use this to allocate one word's worth of storage. So what does this do? Uh, that has not changed our code at all, but our data now contains a single item of, of uh, data called return storage. And of course, return storage is illegal, it's too long. Right, this is still not working. So, yes, we are going to have to deal with names. So rather than actually use the name of the subroutine here, we're just going to put a, a numeric identifier in. So that's just going to be current sub ID. And subroutine is here. We just, we add an ID field, it's initialized to zero. Go back to our code generator. And every time we start a subroutine, we simply allocate it a new ID. So 
subroutine one s1 so this then allows us to do uh, D. Okay. So this should actually be a working program. It doesn't do much. So let us try assembling it. Nope, I didn't like it. Uh, oh, yeah. Going to have to tweak our... our program slightly. Uh, so we need to define a few variables. So when the system boots, it will call startup, which will uh, relint releases the interrupt flag, basically enables interrupt. We then call our main subroutine, which is here. When the main subroutine returns or we jump to exit, we simply go into an infinite loop and keep poking the night watchman, otherwise the system will reboot. And we don't need this ease anymore. However, required extend is missing. This brings us to another interesting point about the AGC instruction set, which is they extended it a number of times so they ran out of space. So they ended up adding this extend um, instruction. This allows uh, two word opcodes. The assembler ought to omit extend itself when you call qexchange. I mean, it warns you that you need it, uh, but they they never got around to implementing it. Therefore, Yarul being a uh, an honest replica of the original Yule also does not do it. So this actually means that each of these is two words long, which is a bit of a shame. Yeah. So that is our new program and it assembles. Let us load it into the, that wasn't what I was expecting. So yes, sorry about that. Um, I found a bug. <laughs> so it turns out that if you put the label and the instruction on different lines like this, then Yayo accepts it fine, but then the actual simulator crashes. <laughs> uh, so so you see that loads fine. And if I it's produced the same binary. So what's actually happened is uh, the AGC simulator has failed to parse the uh, the symbol table. So Yoyul is generating an invalid symbol table. Well, that's nice. That means that we're actually going to have to, you know, do some more work here. So we have to emit the label and the instruction on the same line. And this actually breaks a couple of assumptions of the generator core. So what we're going to do is we're simply going to cache the label in a uh, in a buffer. Uh, just give it a random size for now. Uh, 
and yes, def. So calling label will simply set the buffer and we're going to check to make sure that we don't emit two labels in a row because that won't work. And then when we emit a structure of code, we are just going to stick the label in the front. So that actually simplifies our model quite a bit. So that's nice. All right. So label, label. Let's try this. Okay, this is just like boilerplate. And yep, I have in fact used the wrong modifier here. Um, dot, I think. Not quite. Okay, I'm just gonna have to read the instructions. want to left justify minus yeah okay. printf is great it's so intuitive that's better okay now we are going to assemble it now we are going to run it in the simulator oh good so we should be able to put a breakpoint on s1 run the program uh, we can, sh I can show you the address, show you the value of Q. So, uh, the AGC does everything in octal. GDB over here, or at least AGC's ra rather poor simulation of GDB, this is not GDB itself, does everything in hex, so that's convenient. So I can simply Step to there, I can then examine the contents of Q1, which is what we expected. We step again, we're at the return address. Q hasn't changed, we return to somewhere. Yeah, we are actually at uh, the address we wanted, which should be here. Yes, we're at exit. I don't know why it hasn't actually shown me a line number. Yeah, I think the line numbering's a bit wrong. I suspect it hasn't taken these and include directives into account. Yep, and it just spins forever. So we now have our first actually working program. Good stuff. So we can now emit labels. So our arch emit label is going to be easy to do and our arch emit jump is also going to be easy to do the jump instruction as i mentioned is tcf in general instructions which end in the f mean fixed memory fixed memory is the agency's terminology for rom some instructions will only work on erasable memory, that is RAM. Some will only work on fixed memory. Some of them are really confusing. Uh, but yes, just done that. So, oh yes. Label alias is generated by the compiler core when it wants to make one label the same as another label. And this is actually... Um, 
the syntax is slightly different. So we want to do uh, this is generated for doing things like conditional uh, sequences of conditional operations because they're hard to do in a single pass. Um, e data. Okay, I've just done that because they were there. So let's go to our program here and let's actually create some code. Ah, we can't actually do any code. We don't have any types. Let's make a type. Now, remember when I said that this machine used 15-bit values? Well, uh, our single type is going to be uh, make number type an int 15, not an int 16, occupying one machine word and it's signed. Now the machine does actually support int 30s occupying two machine words, but I'm not going to actually worry about that right now. Make number type here creates a new type, inserts it into the global system table, and we also have to tell the compiler that this is the type generated by a pointer comparison. So that's all that does. So now we can go back to our program and do int 15. Okay. What does this do? Uh, that has worked fine because it's generated no code. Yes. Because we haven't done anything with the variable, it hasn't actually generated any code to, you know, place it anywhere. Now, remember that I was saying that Calgol does not support recursion, so it doesn't have a proper, it, it doesn't need a proper stack. Where a normal uh, stack based language would have a stack frame, we have a thing called the subroutine workspace, which is just a block of memory somewhere. And one of the things we need to do in our epilog is actually allocate space for the workspace. And we use the W variable, the W identifier with the subroutine ID to do that. And Uh, we they again use arrays to allocate memory, but this time we have to tell it how much. And this is the subroutine, subroutine workspace. But because Yule is special, it's actually one less than the workspace. So we can see here that we've actually allocated one word plus zero extra words. Let me double check that because it's really unintuitive. Arrays n skips n plus one bytes of erasable memory. Okay. Where n is an octal or decimal integer constant. I hope that means it takes the preceding zero if it's octal, otherwise that would be weird. So when we get to more to higher values, I should actually check that. Okay, so we can now allocate variables. Let's try and put a number in one. What does this do? Okay. Now we get on to the actual nitty gritty of the code generation. Uh, the code generation uh, system used here is to use a stack. We don't have a stack, so we are going to fake one. Now, the way we do this is We actually have to keep, we're going to keep a, let me think about this a moment. Yes. 
we are going to keep a stack pointer. This will indicate how much stack we've actually used. And we're going to have to create some, a couple of functions to do pushes and pops. And now for the 8080 code generator, I had to remember what it was I was pushing and popping. I think I don't need to do that. No, I am going to have to do that. Uh, I need to track the... Yeah, I need to know whether I've pushed constants that can be then rematerialized later. No, I don't. No, I don't actually. Okay, right. So when we do a push, all we do is increase the stack pointer. However, Each subroutine has to keep track of how much stack it's actually used. So, simple. So we are trying to push a constant. Is our code gone? So this is simply going to uh, load a value from the constant pool and put it into the put it onto the stack. So what we do is we uh, is that the way I want to do it? No, we're not going to do it like that. We're going to do... So this will increment this, uh, increment the stack pointer um, and return the old one. So when we push our constant Yes, what we're going to do is load a constant from the constant pool. And this is done using the CA instruction. Now CA means clear and add. What it does is it clears the A register it loads the value pointed to by its operand and adds it to the cleared A register. The naming is slightly weird. And the constant pool has to live in fixed memory. So that's going to be uh, I will get on to what the constant pool is in a moment. So that will load it into memory. We then need to write it to our stack, our stack slot. Now we can use TS for this, because this has just been read out of 15-bit memory, therefore it cannot overflow. So, And let's just do that. Um, now it wants to write it to a variable. So assign var. Now this will pop a value off the stack. And again, So our code is going to be, we wish to load the value of the stack frame.
and then we want to write it to our variable. Again, we've just loaded it from memory, therefore uh, TS is safe. Okay, what does that do? Right. Now the code is is terrible, but it'll it should you know if I've got everything right it should work. So what this has done is the AGC instruction set does not allow you to actually embed literal constants. So what we're going to do is we're going to have to store the constant value one in fixed memory. And this C0 is going to point at that. So CAF will load the value in C0, which is going to be 1, into the A register. TS is then going to store it onto our virtual stack. Uh, the virtual stack belongs to subroutine 1. I should use a different letter for that. Let's actually... Let's change this to f for function. That's better. S1 is going to be a block of memory that we will, that we will allocate for this subroutine's virtual stack. And 0 is the offset into the stack. Uh, then we load it right back again. Uh, this is the kind of thing that a peephole optimizer would deal with easily. We don't have one yet, but in fact, we probably never will. But uh, I'm not going to worry about that for now. I'm just going to generate bad code. And then we write it to the variable. And the variable lives in subroutines one workspace. That's in fact our workspace is here containing one word. So this does the write. And then we exit the subroutine with these three instructions. So what we need to do now is actually emit the stack. So this is going to be max sp minus one. So that's allocated one slot of RAM for the virtual stack. And now we want to do the constant pool. Now the constant pool is going to be a little bit exciting because we're going to have to store them. The constant pool has to live in fixed memory. We're going to accumulate constants as we compile the program and then emit them all in a chunk at the end. And we're just going to do a linked list of constants. Uh, so ID will be this number here, which will allow us to refer to the constant. We then need to store the value but we're going to also not just store numeric constants, but symbolic ones as well, which are referred to by a symbol and offset. So that's going to have to be struct symbol sim 32t offset. And let's have a function that adds a constant oh, and we also need a linked list of constants so all we're going to do is walk through the list If a constant matches, then just return that ID. So we have found no matching constants. So let's create a new one. Initialize it. 
allocate a new ID for it. Uh, add it to the beginning of our linked list and return the ID. There we go. So in our push constant, we do add constant sim off. There you go. Does that work? That works. And it's actually managed to allocate ID two because one is used by our subroutine. We're just going to use the same ID field wherever. Right, there's also a bit we're missing, which is in our epilog, we actually need to dump all the constants. Actually, I'm just doing, yeah, I'll do it like this. We want to emit a label. And now we want to actually emit the constant itself. Now we're going to, for now, I'm just going to assume that these are all numeric constants, which means that the symbol will not be said, because this allows us to just simplify things for now. Ah, this is not data, this is code, because it needs to go into the fixed memory. Okay. C2 decimal one. Um, and remember that this is actually both of the files concatenated one after the other, although in a really weird way. Why don't I do it like this? And I think I also want N, no. Uh, I th thought there was a option which printed the file name between files. But apparently I was mistaken. Okay. So let's actually run it and see what happens. Assemble, okay. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Now you see, I thought I tried this. Ah. See, I thought I'd check to make sure that you all understood these operators. Uh, I think it does, but you need white space. Yeah, good, phew. Uh, I would have been quite stuffed without that, actually, because I would have needed to generate um, IDs for everything I wanted to refer to. This code generator likes generating code in big blocks. Uh, it likes generating the data tables in big chunks and then using offsets to refer to them. Okay, so that assembles. Let's see, oh good, that works. I'm going to break it, F1, run it. Okay, load constant into A. It's a one. Store into S1. That's the stack slot, load from S1, store into W1 and exit. All right. That seems like a decent start. In fact, that's actually quite a lot of a start. Now we should get constant folding by default due to the the compiler core should do it. Yep, deck two. Let's just check that the constant pool works by defining two labels. Yep, we only have a single pool here. Our subroutine workspace is expanded to contain a additional field. Okay, next thing, let's try loading a variable. So we store one into i and gee, we can 
We can use Cowgirl simple type inference to just do that. Yes, arch push value has failed. Arch push value. Right, what this does is it loads whatever's in the symbol specified and pushes it onto the stack. So this is going to be CA, uh, clear and add. This is our load from memory. And this is actually a we're loading from RAM. So I'm going to use CAE. Uh, CAE and CAF all produce the same fundamental opcode, but Yule gives a bit of extra error checking, which is always nice. And then we store it onto the uh, nope, sorry, that's wrong. We want to, we're actually reading the symbol, we're reading a variable, so we want to we want to read it out of a workspace. So this is going to be the ID of the subroutine whose workspace the symbol belongs to, which is going to be that. Now we want to store it onto the stack, which is like so. I believe that's all right. So what's that done? Uh, so what, what am I looking at? Here we go. Um, I should have put in a feature where it displays source line numbers in the resulting code, but I kind of didn't. So load out of workspace one. Uh, store it into uh, store it onto the stack load it off the stack store it into that offset is wrong that needs to be different yeah what I've done wrong is I need to do I think this uh, offset so uh, the symbol itself is encoded as the owner subroutine and the offset into the subroutine's workspace. But then there is another offset, which is then applied on top of that, which we need to add on. So that actually produces that still hasn't worked. Yes, W1 plus zero. Uh, oh, right. Uh, I need to apply this same fix to the sine var. Yeah. Yeah. U dot var dot offset plus offset. There you go. So this is now storing into offset one in subroutine one's workspace. Good. So we can now define variables. Let's try adding. Let's do some arithmetic. And arch add fails. arch add this one. What this does is it adds the two items on the stack uh, and pushes the result. A more sophisticated code generator, or at least, you know, if I was, if I cared about supporting more than one type, would need to pay attention to the type field throughout. But 
all we need to do for this is we need to add two things and put the result back into memory. So this, well, the destination is what we what we're going to we're going to have on the stack is x y, and then we're going to have as a result x plus y. So the overall result is to pop y and then add on add y to the value of x in place. It turns out that the AGC has some opcodes to help with this. So we've got the a traditional add instruction. Uh, add reads a memory location and uh, adds the value at that memory location to the accumulator. This is traditional enough. We also have ADS. And ADS does exactly the same thing, but it writes the result back to memory. So we need to pop the right hand side, which we're just going to do by loading it from the stack. And then we add on the uh, the left hand side and we don't change the stack pointer. Now I actually think I need stack pointer minus one for that because we are a pre-increment stack. So what code has this produced? Oh yeah, and I need my operators. So we have, we load S1 plus one, we add on S plus, S1 plus zero and write back. We read back S1 plus zero, store it into W1 plus two, that looks all right. Let us run that and see what happens. Wow, it assembled first time. At AGC. Okay. Uh, so uh, yeah, we're writing one to S one plus zero. Now, unfortunately, you know, this is this debugger doesn't support display. And there are some GUI debuggers that work with this, but the only one I found that I could actually like make work is code blocks. And the problem with code blocks is it requires you to set up a project with a build system and everything like that, which I just don't have. So I have to do, I have to use the command line debugger. It's okay once you get used to it, I suppose. So this is storing two right out of our constant pool into uh, our other variable, and I actually need to go through and that puts it onto the stack, that reads it off the stack, that writes it to the workspace. Uh, this is reading a workspace variable, and stacking it, reading a workspace variable, and stacking it. Can I do no that hasn't worked. I mean the debugging hasn't worked. So this should load S1 plus one from memory, giving me two. We then add uh, to S1 plus zero and it'll leave the result in A as well as writing it back. So we get a three, that's nice, that's correct. 
we load it from memory because the code generator doesn't know it's been left in A. Peephole optimizer again, not going to worry about it. Okay, we, we have loaded three from memory, that's worked. We've managed to add two values. Uh, and we've stored it into our workspace. And yeah, and we exit. Right, we can add two numbers. Uh, what we can't do is add on a constant, because that goes through a different workflow. But frankly, it's easy. So uh, what this does is it adds the supplied constant value to the thing on the top of the stack. So this is exactly the same code we're going to use, except that instead of this being a stack reference, it's going to be a constant pool reference. to our value. All right. So here is our add. And C2 here contains our one, which we've used previously. Constant pool is working just fine. Uh, we add and store it. Yeah, OK, that looks fine. Now, the thing I want to do, just for sheer ease of debugging, is I'm going to add in some comments. Uh, actually, I don't need one there. So what am I doing? Add subroutine prolog. I am going to add a comment here. This will just prefix the prefix each each subroutine with the name of the subroutine. Um, I am also going to add comments here. with the name of the symbol. And I'm going to do that wherever we use a W. So I, this is push value. I also need a sign var here. Oh yeah, and this one's supposed to be a CAE because I am reading out of fixed memory. This should make the resulting code, assuming it works, easier to understand because now it tells us that this is referring to a variable called i. Let's put a few more a few spaces in there. Struggling to work my Vim. That's better. Uh, what's happened to C A E? That is a push var. Push value. Yep. Yeah. Okay, much improved. That's actually a decent milestone. So uh, arithmetic works. Okay, now where we're going to where we're going with this is we want to write a game. So one of the things we're going to want to do is we're going to display stuff on this the disk key. The AGC has a whole pile of I/O channels, uh, which is basically I/O ports if you use for a modern machine, and the disk key is attached to an I/O port. I think I've got the documentation for it somewhere because I knew I would need it. Yeah, it's this one. 
what you do is you write formatted words to a particular port and it changes the state of the disk key. Uh, essentially, it's got a few bytes of video RAM. Uh, yeah, uh, the, this is a very fuzzy word wording. Uh, each quote byte unquote represents two digits. And the instructions you give it consist of the address of the thing in video RAM you want to update, followed by uh, encoded opcodes to tell it what you want the state to be. So we are going to want to do this because our game is going to be no use whatsoever without being able to write to the disk key. And to do this, we're going to need subroutines, which we're going to want. Let's just start small with Uh, so this is going to be the digit pair is going to is going to identify uh, which of the pairs we're going to update. Uh, the this lookup table here tells you which ones. So you know if we want to update digit pair eleven, then this changes m1 and m2 which are the two prog things uh, and we're just going to have yeah and there's actually a bug in my actually i think i can fix that uh there's currently a bug in the parser yeah you have to have one statement in a sub. Uh, I think that would do it. Is that going to work? Nope. Okay, I'll deal with that later. For now, I'm just going to put in a semicolon here just to keep the parser happy. Okay, now, if we try to... Why did that work at all? Um, I'm slightly confused by the fact that it actually worked. I was expecting that to fail miserably. Oh. Okay, I know what's happened. Um, yeah, I think I did do a bad merge because it's missing a core piece. Yes, it is. Right. So, Calgol supports nested subroutines. I've nested this subroutine inside the main program, and if I want, I could put more inside that. Doing this properly, each of the subroutines should be taken out of line and emitted one at a time but we're not doing it properly, we're bodging it. So uh, we're just emitting all our code from top to bottom. This means that whenever, it's, whenever it sees a nested subroutine, it's in the middle of the generating the code for the outer subroutine. So we just have to jump over it. And I appear to have lost the jump label. So let's just do, uh, I remember what I did, so this is easy. Before we call the nested subroutine prologue, we omit a jump to the after the epilogue. And after the epilogue, we actually omit the label. Like so. Right. And I also need to put in a bit more. Put in a blank line there to make it usable. Okay, so this is our main subroutine which extends from here to here. Here is our nested subroutine. So 
We enter the main subroutine. We then do a TCF, which jumps over it to here, and we exit. Meanwhile, the nested subroutine has got its prologue, its epilogue, and uh, yep, and down here it has emitted the the workspace needed. Uh, I'm a little disturbed by this stack stuff. This is because there there is no stack usage. So let us just do if current sub max sp is not equal to zero. Let's just do that. That's better. Ah, we also do to do that for workspace. Okay, so Q, uh, subroutine two, which is disky set opcode, has got three words of workspace for our three parameters. They've been allocated by the compiler core. Uh, and every subroutine has one word to store the Q register in. Now, the reason why I was expecting this not to work is we also need to add some code to load the parameters. And this is where it's going to get rather interesting. So I have to pass parameters on the stack, but I have no stack. So how am I going to pass parameters? This is actually the second version of the Calgol compiler. The first version was vastly more complex, completely self-hosted, uh, would run on like a Z80. Um, I managed to recompile part of the Calgol compiler with itself on a two megahertz 6502. It took forever. Uh, the way it did things is that when you called a subroutine, it would poke the parameters directly into the subroutine's workspace. This worked fine, but if you have situations where you have this kind of expression, so the compiler comes along, it reads this, it says, oh, you're calling foo. Here's a parameter, poke that into the first uh, word of workspace. It's made of a three for clarity. Poke that into the first uh, parameter of foo's workspace. Evaluate this. Oh, you're calling foo. Poke one into the first word of foo's workspace. Poke two. Call foo. Get the result. Poke that into the second word of foo's workspace. But this call here has corrupted this. And in fact, it got worse. I'm amazed my compiler worked at all. Uh, because uh, other calls to foo happening from elsewhere, if I call, if I actually did that, but bar was calling foo. Now the language prohibits recursion, but you're allowed to do that because when bar is calling foo, foo hasn't run, but we're still relying on foo's state. So that's just not going to work. So what we have to do is, when we call a subroutine, we have to pass a pointer to where the parameters are stored in the caller's stack, which we will then, in the call E, dereference the variable, load the pointers, poke them into the call E's workspace, etc., etc., etc. So rather than deal with these call E stage, I'm actually just going to go straight for the caller. Let's just do set opcode one, two, three. And now we run that. It fails due to arch push input param. And this is what this does is it tells the back end that the thing on the top of the stack is an input parameter. The 8080 code generator 
the thing on the top of the stack might not actually have been real. It might have been a constant waiting to be rematerialized. But in our code generator, it's always real, so that is empty. Now it's failed with arch emit call. So I'm just going to take that out so that this will run. And you can see here, this is where we've started doing the call. We're assembling the parameters into the stack from left to right. We're reading a one, poking it to the virtual stack. We're reading a two, poking it to the virtual stack, etc. And our actual call will go here above the extend. So what we need to do here is get a pointer to our current stack, which is going to be a, going to put this into A because it has to go into A. Uh, it's a constant. And this is going to be, uh, this is actually our first non-numeric constant. And I think I screwed it up. What we're going to need to end up with is uh, CAF C99, C99, and this is going to have to be a reference. We use the symbol word for this. this so this will, uh, this will, uh, where is symbol? Uh, interesting. See, I saw this in another piece of source code. Uh, I hope I wasn't hallucinating it in this version of um, this version of UL actually supports it. So what this this possibly mythical symbol pseudo operation, what it does is it allows you to insert a the address of a symbol into the opcode stream. Now, how are we going to do this? Uh, we're going to bodge it. So, allocate an ID, stack reference, ID, uh, e data. So, this is going to be a symbol referring to uh, we want the current subroutines virtual stack plus the stack pointer minus one uh, no actually because our stack grows up so we in fact are going to need input parameters. So this will actually give us a pointer to the base of the uh, the base of the parameter block. Here we are going to simply uh, load the address into the A register, and then we transfer control to the callee. How does that actually work? Here is our symbol lines. So let's push it through Yayul. Unrecognized opcode pseudo op symbol blast. Uh, I hope I can do this. So we've got. What have we got in terms of pseudo codes? We've got two FC address. Uh, 
emits a double word constant. Yeah, yeah, this is for doing far calls. The AGC RAM, well, the AVC ROM is banked. And uh, the DTCF instruction here allows you to switch banks and jump to a particular address. Is there a 1F adder? Bank equals arrays, memory, alt sixes, set lock. Hmm. So the, the I wonder if just deck will work, to be honest, for a decimal constant. Oh, I think that worked. And that wants to be SRED. Uh, line 20, the address is not in fixed memory. Uh, that's not data, that's... Ah, that's a constant. I'm going to have to use the constant pool for this. Yeah, what's happened is is actually put it into the, the RAM section. Uh, and luckily, our CAF here, which only allows fixed memory, this is ROM, has caught it for us. Okay, I'm going to have to do this slightly properly. I think we're going to need to have different types of constant. But I really don't want to do that. That's going to be a bind. Uh, I could, you know, just store the strings. Yeah, let's just store the strings. It's a bodge. So if the string matches, otherwise there we go. That's her. That's terrible. So this is just going to be uh, and we're actually going to be using these symbolic constants quite a lot. So We'd actually make a helper for those. Take int add sim constant struct symbol sim int uh, off add constant. Uh, okay. If it's a numeric constant, then just store. The offset part, else it's a reference to a variable, always. 
So again, this is going to be our long complicated expression, which is the uh, the owner's ID uh, guard of sub ID. plus the, you don't add, the offset plus the extra offset okay and now we go to our epilogue and this is very simple it's just Okay, is that build? Cool. Let me support those now. Okay. So that means that this is now just a perfectly ordinary constant. Add constant. And let's hope this works. So what's that done? Here is where we are loading the workspace. Uh, we'll be loading the pointer to the parameters um, and it's loading this constant which is s1 plus 0 which is the beginning of the subroutines virtual stack which is the first parameter good that works now let's see if it assembles that's nice we'll run it and let's see if the thing's actually set correctly break at x1 run we are code. We're here. Graph C3. So this is just storing stuff. Okay. Cav C6. What does A set to? Uh, zero. That wasn't what I wanted. Well, that looks all right. Uh, these constants are all zero. That's surprising. Format is a repeat count, so let's actually look at what's in S1. That's garbage. I think I haven't read it correctly. Yeah, that address is garbage. Oh, that's showing, right, that's dereferencing. I want to do that. That's better. So, okay. So it has, in fact, loaded those three values correctly. And what we are at... Uh, why is Z being reported as zero? Z's not zero. I think the debugger's gone mad. D 
Defaults for format and size letters are those previously used. Default count is one. Let's do that again. Okay, break x1. Actually, no, let's break in f2. Okay, we're at x1, we're at f2. What's a? Zero. That's not right. Okay, I think what it's done is it's uh, tried to pass this as a decimal constant and has failed. Um, I can figure this out for sure by simply looking at the assembled binary. So we're looking for so yeah, 15-bit words, but they're actually packed into uh, they're packed into the the binary as 16-bit words, but each one is shifted each 15-bit word is shifted left, so the bottom bit is zero. So just to make things extra unreadable. So we've got a 06. 04, 02, that's our 1, 2, 3. Right, and here in fact is our constant. That just hasn't worked. Okay, um, I am going to go figure this out and restart. Be back in a moment. Okay, I think this is both much easier and much worse than I was expecting. So I think all we need to do here is to simply do uh, TC and uh, where's my hex editor gone? There. So here we see our 642 and before it here is the address. Uh, shifted left by one. How does that work? Turns out the TC instruction, which takes a address as its parameter, is encoded as a zero plus the address. So what this has done is it actually just emitted the address into the code. That's vile, but it might just work. So let's actually try this for real. Let's go to F2 run. Right, what is A set to? A is set to 4A. What is the address of S1? 4A. Right. Phew, that's worked. I was worried there for a moment. So that is part of the call. The other part of the call is, uh, well, one of the many parts of the call is uh, the CalGoal calling convention requires the called subroutine to adjust the stack to consume the parameters. So we actually are going to need to retract over. And in fact, we can just do that here because that simplifies the code like this. Uh, the back end, the front end compiler does not currently support output parameters. I'm hoping not to need them. Okay, so now we can call subroutines, but our subroutines can't be called, so let's fix that. Right, in the subroutine prologue, we then need to index through the parameters, and uh, we need to work through the parameters, passed in, dereferencing them, and uh, place them in the subroutines workspace. Now we can save a lot of time because we know that all our parameters are the same size so we don't need to bother about like the uh, we don't need to bother about walking the parameter list we can just use the count. As I said this is a bodge. So if current subroutine has some input parameters 
then we know A will contain the address. We wish to put this somewhere safe. We're going to use Q, which we just corrupted for this. So this is going to be, we are going to use TS, transfer storage, because we know that A is an address and therefore cannot have overflown. So store that in Q. And now, one parameter at a time, we want to load it. Okay, now, the AGC does have support for dereferencing pointers, but I don't think the designers were expecting it to be used for that. This is the index instruction. The index instruction is mainly intended for jump tables. What it does is it evaluates its parameter, which is a memory location, so the contents of the memory location. And then the next instruction gets that value added to its parameter. So this uh, takes the value in A, adds it to jump tab, and therefore produces a jump table. Now we can use this by reading the value in Q, then loading a parameter, then we can use TS because we know that that's been loaded from memory, storing it into our workspace. Okay, so this has generated this code. Let's compile that. Oh, good. Uh, I was actually a little worried that you all would reject it. Um, I do not believe that the Apollo programmers use pointers anywhere. Pointers are a relatively modern invention. Well, everything computer-wise is relative, given that the initial version of this stuff was written before 1960. Yeah, you literally have to be over 80 to have worked with any of this in real life. That's terrifying. Okay, here we are in our called subroutine. Why is a zero? Is A actually zero? A is zero. Why is A zero? Oh. Uh, yeah, what I did was I... Uh, I modified my test program, but didn't actually change my real program. Okay, let's try that. Yeah, TCS1 plus zero. You will... AGC break F2 run. Oh yeah, well, what is A? A is a pointer. So save Q2, transfer the value of A to Q. What is Q? Q is a thing. Index load. What is A? A is a 1. That is the right value. Okay, I believe that has possibly done the right thing. So let's look at our workspace. One, two, three. That has correctly copied our parameters into the workspace. We can call functions. Fantastic. Okay, let's do a bit of code now, like real code. So the, where's our disky documentation? So the uh, 
the digit reference is stored in the uh, in this field of bits. So that is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven to the left. So uh, the opcode we want to send to the disk key is going to be digit pair times two to the eleven. Um, I do not actually have. Uh, shifts yet in the back-end language and besides the AGC shifts are unspeakable so 2 I've got my calculator out here 2 to the 11 is of course 2048 and then we're then going to add the the left opcode which is C, the left hand digit, that is one, two, three, four, five. And just in case of embarrassments, two to the five is, of course, 32. I was just checking. So left times 32 plus right. Okay. And we now want to write that to the disk key itself. And we're going to use inline assembly for that. But in fact, we're going to do that in a moment because we wish to, we have to do some more compilation work. Okay, we cannot multiply by constants. Let us multiply by constants. Now, I wouldn't have even attempted to do this if I hadn't already checked and the uh, the AGC does have a multiply instruction. Uh, it actually multiplies a double word value uh, that is a thirty a thirty bit integer integer. Uh, sorry, let me do that again. It multiplies two fifteen bit integers to give a thirty bit integer. Now, this is all kinds of weird. You haven't seen divide yet. Divide is something else. So what does this do? OK, the contents of the memory location are multiplied by the accumulator and the result goes into a L. OK, that is fine for us. So all we, uh, let me just double check the, yeah. 12 bit memory address means that it can, uh, it can access the entire memory map. Some instructions uh, take a 10 bit memory address, which means they can only address RAM. So we, we would have to copy the value into RAM to make that work. So extend multiply by and this is a constant so uh, add constant null comma value simple enough um, oh yes we do want to of course pop the value into the accumulator so that I could actually just factor that out uh, I'll just cut and paste it for now. So that bang was me dropping my mouse. Uh, and now we are going to... This is an arithmetic operation. So it may have overflow. Let me see the over oh, the overflow is cleared. There is no overflow for multiply. That's surprising. I am extremely surprised and somewhat suspicious. So let's actually use the exchange instruction. 
just to be on the safe side. Because the exchange instruction drops overflow. Okay, what's that done? Well, that did something. It's generated quite a lot of code. C3 is blank. Oh, oops. This needs to be. That's better. C3 is 2048. So load our parameters of the, the parameter block. Uh, load our first parameter which is digit pair um e s2 load the oh yeah load it back again then we do our multiplication against the constant c3 store it back into s it store it back into the same stack slot then we for the left hand, then for left here, we do the same multiplication, store it back into S2 plus 1. Then we add the two together. Then we uh, read, write, stack it, add it. Okay, that looks suspiciously promising. Now we're going to have to actually write to the disk key. Uh, so the first thing is we want to get our value into A. Next we want to a extend And next, we want to write to the I.O. port. And this is output channel 10 octals, so 10. I think that will do it. Right, this one I assemble it is going to bail because we haven't done our inline assembly yet. So. So we are actually just going to crudely bodge this. Uh, prints and spaces. Print a string. Print a symbol. error what am I thinking of so this means that if there's a label in front of an asm it ain't gonna work hopefully we should get a nice error such as uh, AGC crashing again uh, and as an end is just a new line Okay, build that, and it's failed. Uh, that's, yep. We don't pass in the extra offset for this. Uh, we should, uh, no, we shouldn't actually. This actually needs to be a variable reference. The reason for passing in the extra offset is so that you can do things like refer directly to array uh, members but you're not allowed to do that in line assembly. It has to be an actual variable. So we're gonna call that var. Okay. And here is our, oops. And I'd forgotten that we actually want to, we need to put spaces each side of each value. Uh, 
Okay, so we load the value, write it to the IO port. Right, moment of truth time. Let's actually see if I can write a value. Uh, here is the the map of what values you can write. So let's put in a uh, what have we got here? Nothing very interesting. Let's put one of these in. That's a thirteen. 13 octal, yeah. Do we have the other one? No, we don't. Uh, let's just do a 13 and a 13 and a 14. Ooh, octal. So, so rarely use octal, like never. So here are our 13 and our 14. Okay, assemble. It assembles. Load up the simulator. Fire the disk key, hit the button a few times just to make it notice the simulator's there, and run it. Hmm. That was not really what I was looking for. I've had a certain amount of trouble making the disk key work, to be honest. Uh, it's kind of unhappy about something my programs do, but I am not sure what. I don't think I have to enable it somehow. Some of the other hardware you do have to enable, but... Uh... So this should be digit 34 and 35, which is the bottom ones. And I, I have poked some of these values and just like had them work. So it is a right 10. Yeah, my test program did work. Where is right? Right channel KC moves you can accumulate it into yeah yeah KC is an IO channel nine bit extra code. The overflow is set to the result of the operation. Yeah, uh um, A, L, and Q are actually also I.O. ports, so that you can use write to write to one and read to read from one. This is actually useful in some really bizarre situations. Intriguing. Okay. Let's actually walk through this. Okay, so we are loading our values. Ah, S does work, thank goodness. A lot of the abbreviations don't in this. Right, here we are actually doing code, so we are Right, we are about to do the multiplication. We are multiplying 1 by, by this number, which is 2048. So step, what is A? 0. What is L? What is A? 
Okay, it's put the result in L. Uh, why? Both A and K. Let's sign extended to six. No, that's the wrong one. Oh, this one. Uh, MSU is a great instruction. Remember how I said earlier that it uses uh, one's complement everywhere except when it uses two's complement? Some of the I.O. devices return two complement values, and this instruction will convert from one to the other. Um, they're just like wedged in instructions anywhere when they would be useful. The entire instruction set is a random mess. It worked, but right, least significant word is in the L register. Okay, so A contains all the overflow data. That's why it doesn't set the overflow bit. Because, uh, yeah, because if you multiply to the two of its equivalent of a max int then you still won't overflow a 32-bit result. So where's our mole? Is there a... I was not aware of this instruction. It writes a zero to L. That's useful. Oh, register zero is hardwired to zero. That actually is useful. I'm glad I saw that. If ever we want a zero, then we don't need to bother about a constant. Huh. So, is there an elix? Yeah, uh, elix uh, exchanges the value of L with the value in erasable memory. It's not an extra code. Overflow is not affected unless K is the accumulator. Fantastic. This will just store L. We don't need to worry about all the overflow stuff for that. Now let's try it. Dab our disky. Run. Uh. Okay. Two. Oh, uh, actually, let me just hammer this a bit, then run it. And I'm also not sure why I'm continually hitting F2, to be honest. It shouldn't. It should hit it once. Right, there's something actually very wrong there, so... Where is our code? F2. Okay. So we do our multiplication. XA, XL, XL is 800, XS2, right, we stored that in there as we expect. We now do the left hand side. Okay. So we have encoded the left-hand digit. Uh, we've encoded the right-hand digit. Now we get onto our inline assembly. X, uh, A is our opcode. Extend right to 10. Right, that should have done something. Alright, extend Q exchange Q2. Uh, Q2 
Q is a address return. We should have returned to here. Extend Q exchange Q one return. Intriguing. Is this actually still running? Yep, still running, it hasn't crashed. Thinks it's connected. Well, it does not now. It does think it's connected. Okay, so let me double check my program. See, I actually have a test program here that somebody wrote, which actually like stores it. Uh, it does work. I can run this. Uh, oh yeah, it does work. So I know that it is actually possible to write to this thing. So the problem is my code somewhere. This is the test program. It's all AGC machine code. So these represent the various digits. This syntax here means one shifted left by 11 bits. Which I believe is um twenty forty eight. I'm going to just do a so the documentation here does actually have an example. So this should display, this particular sequence should display 2, 3 in register 1, that is the top number. So let's just actually try that and see that it works. Make your AGC run. Uh, oh, I'm running the peripheral, peripheral program, not my test program. Test agc dot bin run. Okay, so I did have to poke it a bit, but it did actually come up with a number. So I think that has actually worked. So why didn't it work with my number? So the uh, the disky here is a separate program that talks to the simulator via a socket, and it does reconnect when you restart the simulator, but not always immediately. Which is not terribly satisfactory. Okay, I believe I am miscalculating my bit field. So let us actually siphon out the. The actual value that we're writing and then we turn it into binary and take it apart and see that it actually works. Nine six C. Now I need to turn that into binary for which I will use my uh, 
Okay, it's actually... Uh, 1011, 6 is... 0110, C is... Uh, 1100, I believe. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, yep, let's see. So here is the value that they suggested. So the we've got should we take those spaces spaces out? It's five bits per yeah per digit. Two, three, four, five. Followed by one bit for the um For the things like setting the plus and minus, followed by four bits for the actual opcode. So this is the thing I try to send, and this is the thing it tried to receive. Well, let us change our codes so we're actually generating what they are sending. Because maybe this disk key doesn't understand non-digit numbers. It should. It's but yeah, let's just try it and see. So this is uh, nine plus 30, okay, well, I don't trust my ability to do mental arithmetic, so I'd much rather use tools for this. One, one, oh, oh, one, in decimal is 25. One, one, oh, one, one, one one oh one one in decimal is twenty seven. Okay. Um and I'm gonna swap those round so that I will actually be able to see something change on the disky. So run Yule, run AGC, poke the disky a few times run. That changed. Okay, I just don't think it likes non-digit numbers. But I believe we are getting somewhere now. So we now, actually I'm just going to put in the, this. I do not believe the sign bit is used for uh, this is this is digit seven, so it's this one. Twelve thirteen. Interesting, where is the Oh yeah, um, so it doesn't have, there are actually two sign bits. So you get a positive sign bit and a negative sign bit. And if you set, if you unset them both, then you don't get any sign at all, which is what the situation is here. So to test that, let's actually just set that to a one. Oh yeah, let's just swap these around again. Make. You will AGC run poke. There we go. So that has actually worked. Good. I was extremely worried that wasn't going to work. So we can now set raw op codes. We want to actually now write a value. Uh, I'm wondering the best way to do this. The mapping between D 
digits and values is kind of strange. And I do not believe that it's possible to convert from one to the other. I think you need a lookup table. See, what I'm wondering is, do I actually need to go and support uh, subroutine return codes for this? I think to do it properly, yes. But in the interest of simplicity, we're just going to bodge it. So the Uh, I'm looking for a lookup table here is the lookup table so what we're just going to do is steal that and embed it into our test program it's a complete violation of everything we hold dear but it's going to actually let us get stuff done. So the way to do this properly is that I go away and uh, add support for uh, return values to the subroutines, which I just haven't done yet, haven't got around to it yet. Uh, and then I, will, then I would write a subroutine that does this conversion. But we're not going to do that. We're just going to do this key digit. And this is going to it's going to receive the digit we want in A. And we will then load a value from the lookup table and return. That's all it does. So that's actually like commendably dense for this ancient architecture. So what this does is actually, let me just do CAF. What this does is we're going to call it with a value in A, and we don't need to use the traditional the the, the cowgirl calling convention for this. It's a helper tool. Um, the digit is going to be an A. It adds that onto the address of digpats here, loads it, and we convert zero to nine to one of these. Okay, back to our test program. So this is going to contain a digit pair. A sign. A left and a right. So just like the one above. But this is going to use raw digits. Uh, so we... We load left, we call this key digit. That leaves the result in A. We know it can't overflow because it's just loaded it from a constant. And we store it back into left. We do the same for right. Disky set raw op code digit pair sign left right. There we go. Make symbol disky set set digits. Okay. Yule AGC poke the disk key a few times run four and a three fantastic it's exactly what we wanted okay now we're going to start with 
actually setting complete values. So register is going to uh, how do I want to do this? Because we actually have traditionally this line is register one. Let me point in this. This is register one, this is register two, this is register three. And then you've got prog, verb, and noun, which are uh, separate. These are two digit values. We're really going to want to set all of these to do this right. Can I do this all in a single um, single operation? I think we probably can. So register is going to be one, two, three, four, five, six. And there's also going to be a value. We are going to want to disassemble our number into digits. And we need a array for this. Now, we do have arrays. A We have five digits, so we do that. Now we need to actually uh, decompose our value into individual digits. I'm wondering if this is the right way to do it. I don't think it is. I don't think we want an array. Yeah, we're actually going to work. We're going to work right to left. So we're going to start needing to do conditionals. If register is one, let me find this. If register is one, we start at 15. Twenty-five, fifteen, twenty-five, thirty-five. Octal. Octal is always octal. Yeah. Four then digit pair. Um, I haven't implemented else or else if yet. Uh, M one. No, hang on. No, the, these aren't the addresses. These are the. Gah. Two sets of lookup tables. Fourteen fifteen is six. Twenty four twenty five is is. Wait a minute. Twenty four twenty five. Really? 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. 15. 21, 22, 23, 24. 25. Split with 31. That makes no sense. Eleven. Oh dear. Okay, that's really awkward. See, I was expecting to be able to simply point at the digit pair on the right. And then we start decomposing the number into digits while working left. But uh, we can't. I think we're actually going to need to decompose it into digits, into an array. And then we probably need custom code 
for each of the registers to set the values. Oh well. Okay, let's have an error. Let's have an error, error array. And uh, that's five digits. So while i is not equal to zero loop. Okay, I think that's enough for now. What we're going to do is divide value and calculate the remainder. That's not going to work because we don't have comp equals const. So let us start with conditionals. Right, conditionals are where the AGC really starts showing its unique ways of doing things. So the way this particular call works is it says if this symbol is equal to this constant value, jump to true label, otherwise jump to false label. And we are just going to check if value is zero, uh, sorry, if the value on the stack is equal to sim and value. This is, that should be, that should be off actually. Uh, if this, because you're allowed to compare pointers, so if sim is set, then sim and off represent a label. If sim is not set, then off is a value. So if you say, if not sim and value equals zero, so this means, is it actually the constant zero? Then we can use optimize routines Otherwise, we will not implement that for now. Uh, no, actually, we're going to... Yeah, we're not going to implement that for now. So, comparing against zero. Uh, a, there is... There, there's... Here we go. BZF. Branch zero to fixed. Jumps to a memory location in fixed memory if the accumulator is zero. So, the first thing we are going to need to do is load the value from the stack. Plus the, uh, the stack offset. And we are popping this because we are consuming it. Uh, so it branches if the accumulator is zero. Oh, and this is, by the way, sign. Uh, this is one's complement. A one's complement value. Actually, let's start with a two's complement value. A two's complement value has got one is zero is oh, that's binary on the right minus one is so the advantage is that the difference between zero and minus one is the same as the difference between one and zero. Now one's complement does this one is zero is minus one is and in fact it's worse than that because this is plus zero and minus zero is also a thing so yes the documentation refers to behaviors if it's plus zero or minus zero uh, oh and also on the agc if you take plus one and you add minus one the result is minus zero this is apparently documented. Okay, that should be straightforward. Load the value off the stack. If it is zero, jump to true label. If it is false, well, otherwise, jump to false label. And our hypothetical and mostly mythical peephole optimizer 
we'll then take care of making sure that that hmm we'll take care of making sure that the code looks reasonably good two labels emitted in a row okay what am I going to do about that? Uh, is there a pseudo operation that just that doesn't increment the the program counter? Bank sum. Yoyul silently discards this directive. Count. Let's try. Let's just try sub row, shall I? Okay, now that is the height of evilness, and I do not know if it will work at all. Here is our program. It's beginning to get quite big now. It's going to get bigger. Uh, I forgot to put my What do you mean two labels emitted in a row? There's no label there. And e data. That's a perfectly legitimate label. And then this one, this then sets the new label. Okay, that appears to be discarding a label. CFX6. I don't really want to step through this as uh, a step through the deep the debugger. Uh, let's see if I can do this the clever way. Has that done anything resembling the right thing? Where are we? I 
Ah, label namespace and IDs don't occupy, are, are different. Okay. Um, Well, as this happens immediately after our branch, bzf, okay, after here, complete with constant, branch equals const. And actually, before I do that, let's just put back our error. Okay. Okay, so we're here. Back up. Now we can put a breakpoint on e-label. Break label. Label is blank. Okay, label contains X6. Where did this happen? One eight seven. We are ah ah right right. This yeah. This is when you call arch label alias. This is always going to happen. So we are going to bodge it. So we have a label, but no instruction. Right, and that also explains why uh, we weren't seeing anything, because the other half of this particular operation was being emitted into the data segment rather than the code segment. So yeah, I think if we could do if label zero, e code sub row. Mm -hmm. Right, so what's happened here is this is our while loop here. It's, uh, it's compiled this expression and, is a, and it's generated two new labels for the true and the false destinations. However, the The while loop proper has generated a label for the beginning and a label for the end. The beginning is, has to be there so it can jump back to the beginning. And the end has to be there to, in order to, you know, terminate the loop. So the false label generated by this needs to be connected up to the exit label generated by the while loop. So what we do is we just equate them together. So you're saying, here we can see if the condition, uh, if, if the condition fails, then we jump to X7, that is the conditions false label. 
x7 is equal to x5. x5 has been generated by while and is then emitted here. This is the end of loop label. So x6 here is the true label. So let us actually just try assembling that. And I'm not going to pipe the result to null because I want to look at the symbol table. So I want to see if x6 and x7 are similar. Oops, fatal errors too. Uh, required extend is missing. That's easy enough. BZF. One to one address is not in the in. Yep, that's simple enough. That's a constant that needs to be fixed memory. Fatal error zero. Now x5 and x6. Is this actually? So I can get this into. Uh, I think it sorted them. X5, 4254, x6, uh, 4245. Oh no, it's x7 I wanted. Yeah, these are in fact the same label. Good. I think that has even worked. Right. So we know we have loops, by the way, and conditionals, if we'll work. So we have looped uh, So we now want to divide value by 10 and get the remainder. This is going to take this is going to bring us to the AGC's mind boggling div uh, opcode. At least it's got hardware divide. The trouble with div is it's kind of weird. Um, it produces the, div the division and the remainder, which is fairly normal for a div, to be honest. Uh, and we want both the division and the remainder, but we can't get it using our API. So what we're actually going to do is just go uh, and in fact it's much nicer to do a multiply so we then do remainder equals value minus value times 10 Uh, the remainder, uh, the remainder actually goes straight into an array, like so, and then we can say value equals new value. Okay, this key set register one comma one two three four five. So uh, what's this going to complain about? Div const, we can't divide by a constant. Now the thing I don't the thing about div is it's it's quite expensive, it takes a whole 70 microseconds. Uh, it takes a uh, a 30-bit pair divides it by a single precision, that is a 15-bit value, to produce the result. The problem is the pair that you're dividing by must be bigger than the thing you're dividing the, the, than the thing you're dividing it by. Otherwise it produces garbage. Now, because we're producing a register, we're dividing a register pair in A and L, 
but with the thing we're dividing it by is a single precision value that is a 15 bit this documentation is all based on double precision numbers and single precision numbers they all represent numbers between minus one and plus one using fixed point um, representation but we're just dealing with integers The integer is large, quite to be larger than the one's complement integer in A. Leaving the quotient in A and the remainder in L. This is natural since the quotient would be too large to fit in the A register. But if you're dividing 2 by 3, we obviously get zero. So why would the quotient be too large? Okay, well, to generate code for this, we are dividing by a constant. So the thing we're dividing by, which is the k, is going to be in a constant pool. So we know that we are at some point going to need to do db c percent d add constant d percent d value. The thing we're dividing the thing we're actually dividing needs to be in A, and I bet this is an extra code, so it is an extra code. But the the, uh, the requirement that we are, so we are also going to have to 0L, which now that I found that ZL instruction is easy, but before we do any of this, we have to uh, compare the two. Why me? We need to compare the two things we're dividing to check for the larger, the largeness requirements. And we need to do this without mangling signs. Keys required. It does say that it's uh, that it's the magnitude that's the issue. Is there a way to get the absolute the absolute value here? Uh, so this is this is not part of the AGC instruction set. This is part of the interpreter which is a big chunk of AGC code, which was used for doing stuff like trigonometry. How do we, how do we take the absolute value? Uh, well, the simplest thing to do, to be honest, it's probably an easier way to do this uh, is to mask off this is used as an this is an and instruction uh, 
Okay, so what we're going to need to do is mask it with, of course, a constant. which is a 14-bit value. So this is the mask including the sign bit, and we, but we want to drop the sign bit, so this becomes a 3. And we then put it in L. Then we need to uh, subtract. Have we subtracted yet? subtract yet. In fact, we are subtracting a constant, so we could just like uh, so we could just add the negative. Um, okay, so in this this particular ending is two's complement because it's done in the compiler. So we're just going to mask off the top of the value, including all the sign stuff. If it's negative, that ain't going to work. Uh, we actually want the absolute value, the properly absolute value. Uh, yeah, there is actually one of these. Abs value. Okay, now we need to compare. This is going to take us to the other comparison. This is why I did the optimize compare with zero, partly because it produces better code, but partly because we don't have to touch this. Where is it? Count, compare, and skip. What this does is it stores a variable from RAM in the accumulator, decrements it, and then performs one of several jumps based on the original value of the variable before it was decremented. Now, our value is actually in the accumulator, so we are just going to do CSA. Because remember that uh, the accumulator is memory mapped. That actually is, A is at address 0. So Now then, once it's actually done this, it then jumps to one of the four instructions following, depending on whether it is greater than 0. Uh, I got that. I got that. Greater than zero uh, or positive overflow, equal to zero, equal to positive zero, less than zero or negative overflow, or equal to negative zero. What we want to do is we are subtracting the thing we're dividing from the thing we're dividing by. So we've subtracted the thing we're dividing by, therefore if the value is 0 or negative, uh, having the two values the same is also considered a no-no with the divide instruction. Having the value 0 or negative means that uh, is equal and they are non zero, then the A register we stored with garbage. So only in the case where the result is strictly positive do we want to proceed to this. Otherwise, we want to load the result with zero. How do we do this? 
where we want to create a couple of labels. So, um, So this is simply going to be so they said that uh, register seven is hardwired to zero. No name, not associated with cord memory, hardwired to zero. Yep. So let me just go to my test framework and add a new register name. So we can just say zero. Yikes. Okay. At this point, we want to actually do the uh, insert the jumps the appropriate places. So, what we've got greater than zero, then zero, then negative, then negative zero. So, in the first situation, the, the first one is the only one where we want to. actually proceed. Uh, the, for all the others we just want to go to do zero. In fact we can we don't need that at all. We can just do three knobs. Okay. That was slightly terrifying. Uh, oh, and this will leave the result in A and the remainder in L. Uh, that should be do div label. Twenty seven arch sub. Arch sub? Really? Oh, subtract. Okay, that's easy enough. Uh, actually, not quite, not quite that easy because we need to make sure it's the right way around. This is going to load the right hand side. This is going to load the left hand side because we pop the right hand side. Then, if so, if we just do this, we pop the right hand side, then the left hand side. So. And we want to put there's there is a SBS, there is no SBS. We may actually have to do this the old fashioned way. Okay, there is there is no sub and store. There's just a uh, SU that leaves the result in the accumulator, so that's absolutely fine. So we are going to So we pop the left, well we don't pop anything, but we take the left hand side, we subtract the right hand side, adjust the stack pointer, and now we want to put the result back into memory. 
And because we've done arithmetic, we can't use percent %s. So we do this. Arch assign pointer. Ooh, pointer to your references. Yeah, this is the arrays code we're dealing with. We're trying to write to, we've just, we've actually in our test program here, this is a whole bunch of new functionality. What this has to do is uh, take the address of digits and add on i to it and then dereference the result. The, the AGC can actually do this in much more efficient code, but we're going to have to do it this way until I do my rewrite. But anyway, how to assign a pointer, arch assign pointer. Uh, this takes the, on the stack there is, uh, there is pushed the destination and the value in that order. So the destination pop the destination into A Do a index with the destination address. And then do a store. And TS is safe because this has come out of memory and therefore cannot overflow. So the value at this address will be read, added to zero, and the store will happen there. Symbol disk set register. This is actually a proper compiler error. Disk E set error set register. Okay, how we have quite a big program. What have we got here? Disk set register, disk E set register rather is here. Uh, read the parameters. Um, set i this is our while loop so we do the comparison there's a, a really dubious sub row uh, this is decrementing i and we can do better than that so if not sim and off equals minus one e code decor Finding stuff in this document is surprisingly tricky. Uh, is there a decker? There's an inker. I'm not sure there's a decker. Oh, that's a dis that's disappointing. Okay, apparently there's no decker, but we can do an inker. This is a memory in play, an in place uh, increment value at address instruction. Let me just double check that it is. Okay, it's a label, blah, blah, blah. Uh, is it Signature Reggie? Yeah, yeah. Yep, yeah, but there is no. 
detriment. Anyway, um, back to our test code. New value equals value divided by 10. Don't know where these new lines are coming from, but. This is the division itself. I know where the new lines are coming from. It's because I ah. have it. So that's kind of terrible. It'd be nice to be able to move this out into a helper tool, but I'm not sure I can because it's got references to specific constants and addresses and so on. Uh, then we get onto this stuff, which will uh, that assigns to new value, fetches new value, multiplies by 10. Presumably, stores the result. Uh, source result on the stack. Right, this is our... Why is that done in add? Oh, I know what that's doing. This is... Wait a minute. Sorry. Wait a minute. I don't know what that's doing. Why is that a minus two? S8. Uh, that's the stack pointer. That's, uh, that's completely ma mangled the stack. What have we done here? Uh, div const, we are actually dividing by constant. Yeah, we don't want to pop here. We just want to refer to the previous item on the stack. Because the result of the stack will be unchanged. The result of that operation will be an unchanged stack. So, uh, where were we? So here is our multiplication by 10. When we then put the result onto the stack position two. Uh, actually, I want to find my, there are two multiplies. Why are there two multiplies? There should not be. I think that's multiplied by one, to be honest. Okay, um, now code compilation goes left to right. So what this has actually done here is taken the i and has applied it to produce a pointer to this and pushed that onto the stack. Then we calculate this value. So this stuff up here is it doing the, is it calculating the pointer? So we actually Wait a minute. Where are we taking the the address of that? Well, digits is a symbolic constant, so ah, yeah, okay. Um, digits is so this is not actually generating a pointer. What it's doing is it's using that symbol plus extra offset thing. So the symbol is a fixed address in memory referring to this array here, and but it will carry around the scaled offset, which is I here. So this is scaling the offset. So C13 is going to be one. Yes. Uh, so we can actually like, 
improve that. Null const if value equals one. Notice you don't get a symbol for this. You can't multiply by symbols. Then do nothing. The value is unchanged. Okay. So. So that is stuck on the stack. Now we do the, this will be the new value times 10. Yep. Store it back. Subtract. Do the pointer assignment. Uh, that doing the pointer assignment. Copy value to new value and finish. Okay, let's see if this actually assembles. Unrecognized opcodes, Unicode, NOP. Okay. A parand out of range. 130. Oh, oh, oh. I know what's happening. Do you remember I said that? Yeah. Some of the instructions, the operand has to be in RAM. So, yay, that's just what I wanted. So what we're actually going to have to do is... Oh dear. Uh, we want to put that in L. So C A E T S L. And we have to do this first because the CAE will restore into A, which will then corrupt. So if you put it, if you put it after here, that's an SU. Okay, yeah, yeah, that should work. One, two, eight. The address is not in erasable memory. Well, that'll be the other. That is my mistake. Oh, one three two required extend is soon extend. It is an extra. It is a extra code. They were obviously not intending that people subtracted much. I wonder if I've missed an opcode. One two eight. The address is not in erasable memory. That's another CAE. CF. No, that should be in the, I'm looking for a Oh, stupid. Yeah, okay, that's much better. Uh, right, so the other one will be the other Sue. Uh, no, that's okay, because that's actually reading it from the stack, which is erasable memory. So 144 is DV. Oh. Yeah, DV is the same. It's got to be in... Uh, It's got to be in erasable memory, so we just use the same trick. DVL. Uh, 
162 required extend is missing 162 this one Yeah, if you're doing this for real, assuming that anyone ever actually needs to really write code for the Apollo guidance computer, then uh, index is not an address. Yes, it is. Uh, no, it really is an address. Look, it's right there. Unrecognized opcode pseudo op w0. Yeah, uh, I am slightly fading, so yeah. Uh, TC. Right. Uh. Okay, I th oh, it's it's uh, I think it might be this one that's wrong actually. And the line numbers are wrong. Let's try this. No, that's not helped. Okay, um this might be a Yule bug because that is certainly an address. Are we using index anywhere else? That's just a... yeah, okay. Uh, let me take the docs for this, because I think it said index was index k, and k should be an address. So the thing about... Oh! Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, uh, the thing about um, Yule is that it was developed to compile the original Colossus and Luminary programs, which were written by skilled engineers and then used in real life, so they were like syntactically correct. So it hasn't seen a lot of use with... Uh, invalid code. Like, nobody in their right mind actually does what I'm doing here. So let's try... No, that's not going to work. We're doing that in the wrong order. And is L exchange a extra code? Not an extra code. Yeah, we can get away with destroying the value in uh, on the stack because we just popped it off. So now I can just do index L. Okay, that assembled. Um, let's actually just do. Okay, digit pair is going to be prog, I think, which is M1, M2, which is address 11. Uh, 
So this should Okay, and poke this a bit, and let's just run it. Now, of course, it doesn't work. Were you really expecting it to? So this is going to take a bit of debugging. Um, have we actually got as far as disky set digits? That is label F6. So break F6, run. Okay, we have actually got here, which is nice. So our loop seems to have looped. Whether it's looped the right number of times, I don't know. Maybe it's just my code that's wrong. Writing compilers is an interesting exercise in doing two things at the same time. Okay, so I want this one. Right, that should have copied all the parameters into W6. So let's do W6. And what we have are uh, OB, which is our 11, 0 which is our sign, and garbage twice. Okay, so something here has gone wrong. Yay. Right, um, I've been going for a bit of a while, and I'm slightly losing it, and so I will go and get myself a cup of tea and be back. Uh, this is not going to be, I think, a single sit-down session. Um, I am actually going to have to like go to bed at some point. Uh, thing is I want to get this out on Saturday so normally I just when I'm doing one of these live coding things I just take all day Saturday doing it but this one is not going to be uh, yes I really am losing it uh, this one I've had to do Friday evening because I need time to edit and render it and upload it on Saturday to make the deadline so yeah anyway cup of tea and then let's see if we can make this work if once we do have this work, we've actually broken the back of most of it. Uh, everything else is nigh trivial, I hope. But we'll see. Okay, cup of tea's been acquired. So let's see if we can figure out what's going on here. And I don't want to debug this in situ, so let's just do, let's just make a subroutine and go 10, J in fifteen equals two and K in fifteen equals I divided by uh, we only implemented the constant version of this and sub test div Okay uh thirty four really I fixed that. Apparently I didn't fix that. Uh, the stupid bad merge. I just wonder what else I may have lost. Yeah, uh, the parser rules didn't allow for an empty parameter list. Uh, and uh, we also need to do the same for the argument list. Okay, so here is our test div routine which we're going to be testing. And there are no parameters. So we load i and store it. Then we load i and we go through the whole ludicrous division thing. 
and then wait a minute wait a minute <sighs> see this is why you need tea for these things I never actually got around to storing the result so this needs to be a not a TS an exchange because we just did a division what does division do for overflow? The overflow is cleared. Okay, well, we can use TS then. I mean, TS and exchange, you take exactly the same amount of time. So there's no real reason to use one over the other. Okay, let's try this one. But I'm going to step through this code anyway because I don't trust it. Yeah. And here we store the result onto the stack, load it off the stack, and store it into the workspace. So that is F17. Assemble. EGC break F17 run. So, here's our code. Test div right extend. So, this is not interesting yet. Okay, now we have loaded the workspace into the stack. That is the thing we're dividing by, which is now in A2. Put it in L. Yep, L is 2. Load the thing we are dividing, which is 2. Mask it so that we know that it is uh, positive. Subtract, leaving the result in A, which is positive, that's fine. CCS takes us to the next instruction, which takes us to the actual do division routine. Uh, load the unmasked constant which, as we're dividing by a value where these are the same, it is like the same constant. Put it in L. Load the thing we're dividing. So we've got 10. Divide, oh, that's not right. Oh, why did we put it in L? It needs to be in Q. Because we're about, we need to use L for the other half of the division. Because yeah, we'd have to set that to zero. Make your AGC break F twelve. Uh, F seventeen. Okay. Okay, we load two, we stick it in Q. Q is now two. We load the thing we're dividing by, stick it in A, that's ten. Interesting. Ah right. Uh the reason why it was works why XA works with A is because whatever it's doing to evaluate symbols is turning into a zero. 
which of course that is the memory location of A. You have to use an ampersand to make this work. Uh, zero L, do the division. Right, what have we got in A? That doesn't look right. What have we got in L? Two. The remainder. Uh, should we not have a five somewhere? A is the more more significant word, and L the less significant. I think that's an overflow. I think I should have put that value in L. So, uh, is there a, yeah, I don't think there's a ZA instruction given there's a ZQ and a ZL. Oh, we don't need a ZA because we can just transfer from zero. Okay, yeah. Um, okay, so we actually want to put this... This is the thing we're dividing by, which goes safely into Q. This is the thing that we are dividing, which goes into L. Then we load zero into A. So now we are we are dividing that. So A is zero, L is our actual 15 bit value, Q is also a 15 bit value. You see, break at 17. could use L exchange for this. That would save one word. Okay, so in in A we have zero. In L we have ten. In Q, we have two. Do the division. In A, we have five. Good. Uh, in L, we have zero, no remainder. Good, that has actually done a division. And then we store the result in S17. Yeah. Uh, now, if I go, we might actually get something. And let's try that again after having prodded the disk key a lot. No. Okay, well, we think our division's working. So maybe it's something else. Let's try breaking at set digits again. That is F6. Go. And what does our workspace look like? W6. 
Hey, what do you know? It's a three and a four. It's this three and four. It's worked. So, that's correct. So yeah, now we call disky digit, we do the index, what is A now, A is 1B, yeah, that's actually working. So why isn't it not actually updating the, that's broken an F6, it keeps breaking an F6. Intriguing. I wonder if this is our... This could be a watchdog timer. Shouldn't be. Okay. So, if we break it... For some reason, it doesn't like breaking uncertain symbols. I think it may be... Something to do with upper and lower case, but that's it. yeah, not sure what's going on there. Right, so we have actually hit this piece of code. So this should now keep Yes, I do not know what is resetting the system. This is supposed to keep uh keep poking the night watchman to prevent it from resetting the system. So I think it's not hitting GoJam. So it's not restarted the system. So the only other thing I can really think of is it might be doing something dubious with the timer interrupt. So the timer interrupt itself. Uh, this is the actual interrupt entry point. We uh, this is a double exchange. This stores both A and L into the address here. So that actually stores A into A rupt, L into L rupt. Then we use Q exchange to store Q. This is the standard interrupt saving registers. Then we jump to T3 rupt here, where we schedule another timer interrupt. They come in every 40 milliseconds. We uh, read the, we read new job to keep the night watchman happy. We diminish a clock counter, which we'll be using later. Diminish is fun. Uh, there's two opcodes, diminish and augment. D diminish moves a number towards zero. So positive numbers get less and negative numbers get more. Augment does the reverse. It's actually surprisingly useful. And then we return from the interrupt. So are we hitting start up? We are not hitting startup, but this thing switching to thread 11 makes me think that we are hitting the timer interrupt.
We're not hitting the timer interrupt. Uh, that's very interesting. Is that wrong? Uh, 4000 octal is the start address of the machine in, uh, in one of the ROM banks. So that's where all this code gets assembled. Um, now block two should have done the same thing, but it might not have. So let's just give this a try. No. So we are at GoJam, that's the beginning, the startup code, which is 4000 octal, which is, let me check with my calculator, what the hex, yeah, that is actually the right address. So, Uh, let's say, let's say 800 O X O eight fifty. Okay. Timer three. This all looks right. These values are think known by the debugger. So here we can see that timer three is actually in the right place. So you've got the radar interrupt. That's awesome. Got the joystick interrupt for the LEM. Now we get into the actual code. Uh, so if I do break timer three, and it's not a real symbol. This is never hitting the timer. Ah, I know what I'm doing wrong. I, I'm never actually setting up the timer interrupt in the first place. That's why it's resetting. We're never hitting the interrupt, therefore we're never poking the night watchman. I don't know why this isn't doing it. And therefore, it's never... Uh, so, yeah, okay. Tell you what, let me just stick this piece of code on the end of my, yep, yeah, like so. There's only one thing to do. Great, T3 rocks. This should work now. It doesn't work. Great. Okay, we have actually hit startup. Yes, thank you. What's in time three? Three FFC. Okay. Uh, the time three is a. Uh, it's a. Ten millisecond counter. That's not right. Oh yeah, it is, okay. Uh, the interrupt occurs when it hits overflow. Yep.
What is down rupt? Because we always hit down rupt just after we call main. Okay, the AGC's interrupt handling is, just like the rest of it, it's completely weird. Because the architecture is asynchronous, uh, various internal operations will lock out interrupts. So an interrupt will only occur when the machine thinks it's safe which may happen several instructions after the point where it actually fires. So that could well be happening there. So what is downrupt? Oh, it's a downlink interrupt. Uh, yeah, the downlink shift register is ready for new data. We have no downlink, so that's not relevant to us. So I still do not know why the timer isn't working. Is I have a horrible feeling I know what's going on, uh, which is I'm putting all my data in the wrong place. So I copied a lot of it from this code. So this puts everything into uh, all its data appears at location 68, but time 3. The time 3 is at 26. So this is the memory map for low memory. So we get all our peripherals, uh, alt M, LM only, I assume it's something with an altimeter. I don't think anything else is used there. Uh, new job is not a IO, a memory mapped IO. It is in fact just a variable used by the operating system but it's a privileged variable that the hardware knows about. Okay, so I think I'm all right there. Also, uh, yeah, I hadn't noticed that the timer is actually set up right here, so I don't need to do it here. All I need to do is turn interrupts on and we're done. Okay, so there's two weird things that's going on. One is that we do not seem to be getting values into the disk key, and the other is the program keeps restarting. I know why. Octal. Always octal. Always octal. I hate octal. Okay, let's poke this a bit and run. Okay, right, well, uh, something happened. It wasn't in the right place, but something happened. Digits M1, M2. What we actually got was digits 3, 4, and 3, 5, which is this one. So, yeah. So where are we calling disky set digits? Uh, let's put some tracing in. So the register is ignored completely. So disky set digits here has got a hard-coded octal 11 in the first parameter. 
So we've got C14, C15, and then our two digit values. C14 is nine, that's correct. And C15 is our zero. So why is it showing up in the wrong place? Um, I can only assume that my arithmetic here is wrong. Uh, now, one thing I need to know is, I don't know whether the bit numbers in this are zero or one based. Now, I did count the bit field. So that's two to the zero, two to the one, two, three, four, five, 10, 11. 2 to the 11 is 2048. Let me check that again. 2 to the 11 is 2048. So we have done that correctly. So why has that gone into location 1? Yeah, I do not know. And I did, we did stop at set raw opcode and we did see that the digit pair was set correctly. Let's do that again. Set raw opcode is F2. run okay x4 w2 gives us the location of the workspace so yes there we see that uh, we've got disk key address 9, 9, octal 1, not always octal, I was right, this is decimal and this is binary, uh, and if you're going to use multiple bases, put the prefixes on them. <sighs> Great. Okay. Uh, that may have written here. I am going to do a thing. Clear. Uh, is there anything in address zero? There is not. I is not equal to zero loop. This e set raw opcode I zero zero zero. In loop. So what that should do is clear all the fields in the disk key. intriguing. Right, what's happening here is uh, our program keeps resetting for whatever reason and it's writing the three and the four that we asked it to. This and this have not been reset correctly. Now prog here is M1, M2 and M1, M2 is 
decimal 11. Our loop here starts at 12 and works backwards. The only possible thing I can think of is this multiplication is bad. Or sign is zero. Okay, so this can probably be turned into a loop, to be honest. Maybe? Yeah, I think it could. Okay. So, we are storing, we're writing to address 12 and three zeros. So we do the multiplication. C3 contains 0800. A contains 12. A contains one. Uh, so twelve times O eight O O is not that. That's overflowed. So what we have is a double precision value in AL That's weird. Oh, that's the wrong file with this one. Let me check that documentation for the so I just spotted a block code I haven't seen before. Olsk. Okay, that allows you to test for overflow, which I don't want to do because I don't care. Okay. Uh, the overflow is overflow adjusted. This means that if it's overflow, the overflow flag will be cleared and the value will be changed a bit. Single precision contents of K multiplied by the content of the accumulator resulting in a double precision word in AL. Uh, uh, I've got a horrible feeling. Eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. There are fifteen bits here. Five, ten. 15. That means that top one is the sign 
bit. Oh dear. That's why I can't use a multiply. Because this is one's complement. What we've done is we've mul we've multiplied. Yeah, the multiply is working, but the high bit that would normally go into there is being bumped to the next word. Yeah, um, I walked into this one because I've forgotten that there's actually a fairly small number of available, well, the precision of a 14-bit word is really small. Right. This explains a whole bunch of things I've been seeing with the disky. Um... Uh, Right, the only thing to do here is to not do a multiplication at all and deal with pre-scaled addresses. This would actually produce smaller code. So this ends up being... Uh, well, we can actually do this. Calgold does its uh, does its internal arithmetic at thirty two bits currently, so this will actually produce a proper value. Um, but I don't know whether um, I don't know whether you will do anything useful with it because that value is strictly too big to fit into a decimal okay that's done the right thing it's truncated the decimal value and kept the sign bit so this means that my clear is going to actually be Okay, we don't have sub from const. Sub, sub from is uh, it subtracts. It does that. Now we don't need one for add because add is commutative and the compiler front end will just generate add const both ways round. But we can't do that for sub from, but for sub because sub is not commutative. So this is actually like simple code. Uh, uh, we are, this is our constant. Yeah. This is our constant, so that's a, that's constant. So now I think of it, it makes very little sense to subtract a symbol from a constant. So I should probably just turn this into an ordinary. It should just take an offset. Why is that failed? Because that. Okay. Let's try that again, but poke the disky first. Okay, that hasn't done anything at all. So what I was hoping is this would set the sign bit. So I would end up clearing uh, 
zero uh, addresses one to seven and also one to seven of the top bit set. Uh, wait a minute. Oh no, that should, yeah. Um, S U is <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Let's actually try doing the sub from with an actual sub and see if that makes a difference. Disky, run. Still nothing. Let's just run this. Is my disky still alive? No, my disky is not still alive. It's just not responding anymore at all. I uh, need to kill the disky. Let's try that. Oh, also, let us try actually running the bin file rather than the source. Yep, okay, now it's working. It may have been working before, to be honest. So let's try running our program. No, it just doesn't work. Except I forgot to poke it. No, it just doesn't work. Okay, uh, let's... <sighs> let's try that. Because I forgot that the thing is now pre-scaled, so yeah. Poke, run. Okay, well that's cleared these ones, but it hasn't cleared this zero. That one is, that's digit 11, which is, okay, this is working. Uh, it's just that we don't quite, we're not quite clearing the entire range. So this needs to be an, uh, we don't have a uh, do while we only have while so let's do this the rather than do stupid stuff with uh, off by ones let's just do uh, This will also force us to do a another comparison. No bad thing. Or apparently not. Hmm. So, here we call first disky set raw key code. Here we call the second one. You can see the, the sub from here as it negates i. Uh, we can do better than that. In fact, we can do that. Uh, here we increment i, which as you see is a single instruction now. Here we oh, 
What are we doing here? If i equals nine, yes, what are we doing here? Uh, right, what this has done is it's incremented the value on the stack. Oh yeah, we then load it and write it back to i, yep. Uh, it'd be nice to be able to optimize this to just increment i in place, but uh, we'll see. Uh, the new code generator will be able to let you do that. And now we load i, stack it, and then we Yeah, that loop's not right. Uh, what are we, where are we calling BZF? Only here. So for some reason it is falling through this piece of code. So I can see the CAE. So the offset is comparing against must be must be zero. That's not a zero, that's a nine. That is a nine. Let's double check everything. Do we even have nine in the constant pool? Not that I can see. Okay, uh my suspicion here is this is a compiler front end bug. Do we have any other BZFs? One, two, it's the second BZF. Uh, this nonsense is uh, X13 is the true case for the conditional, uh, which means it's uh, so this this is the if then break. So yeah, this is this is the break statement, which is then followed by the false case, which jumps back to the beginning of the loop. Okay, break arch comp equals const run. So the second time round we have sim equals zero, offset equals zero. So that has hit one of these. Uh, so this is if the left side is a constant and the right side is not a constant. We actually want to pass, yeah, this is backwards. If this is backwards, the others are probably backwards too. So one value is stacked and the other value is constant. And it's selecting which one it's going to pass to the back end in order to... Uh, yeah, that's wrong. So it's pulling the, uh, the values out of the stacked expression node. 
which of course is not a constant and therefore does not contain any of the stuff we need. So let's try this. And yes, my new compiler back end, or rather a mid end it's going to be, is going to replace all of this stuff and everything will get better. I'm sure it will rain puppies or something. Okay, that's more like what I wanted to see. What that's done is it's hit the second case here because we now need to do a proper comparison. And this is going to be uh, CCS again. In fact, it's going to be a sub followed by a CCS. So we need to uh, take the thing on the left, subtract the thing on the right. The thing on the left is already in A. We want to subtract the thing on the right, which is a constant, but we cannot subtract. Uh, but we can't use subtract with a value in fixed memory. So we're going to have to load it into Q or L, probably L, so that's load fixed constant add constant uh, sim constant sim come off encode transfer to L load the thing on the left extend subtract Wait a minute. Okay, yeah, uh, that's a loop counter, so we can't actually use this to do anything for us. So we are comparing, so it's positive first. So that's false. Then positive zero, so that's true. Then again for negatives. So. so that produces this ridiculous code. Yeah, I don't think even a people optimizer will help that. Now let's try it. Poke the disky, run. Not what I was expecting. Different. It's PSP resetting these to nines. That means overflow. Because a nine is what you get when the thing on the bottom is a uh, thing on the bottom. When the actual digit opcode is all ones. So this is all the positive ones, and this is all the negative ones. So by... Interesting. This is a ones complement issue, I'm sure. Uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. That is, have I got that horribly, horribly wrong? Uh, have I at any, yes, here we go. No, actually this is, this is, that's what I wanted. Okay. Right, I was wondering whether I was taking a two's complement value and masking it. Uh, in fact, this is this is this is hopelessly wrong. No, no.
three F F F F. That is twelve, thirteen, fourteen bits. So, yeah, okay, that's the right size. Yeah, if I take a two's complement value and I mask it in the host, and then I add that as a constant, then it's just going to not work. Now I am concerned about these two constants here. Here is my minus 2048 and my plus 2048. I think these two, yeah, the, the, these have shown up correctly as negative and positive constants. I think these two are likely to be, one of them will be this, Thank you, fake GDB, 11 by 2048 is 22528, that's this. That's correct. I mean, it's masked into, an into a signed value. 16384 is just like 16K. I don't know why we're using that, to be honest. This value is our pre-scaled uh, disky address, and it is in fact passed through to set raw opcode, unchanged, ha, <laughs> oh dear, I am so used, so unused to uh, one's complement arithmetic. Oh. So what we what we've got is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 is this. This is minus zero. What do you get if you add one to it? You don't get this. So in fact what we've got is something like here is a here is a disk key address, and we are adding the sign bit, which is this bit here. But we're not getting this because that's what you do in two's complement. What you get is this because in one's complement arithmetic. You can't use additions as if they were ors. Yikes. Okay, so this is going to force us to do the logic operations. Yeah, arch logic op. Uh, logic operations are all the same. So we just have a single entry point and a switch statement. Except they're not the same, not on the AGC, because the AGC is so special. Okay, I'm going to do mask first, because that's the simplest. Case logic op mask. So all we do with mask is we're masking with a constant, so this is all happening in place. Where's that mask instruction? Mask. Uh, and the concept of memory location bitwise into the accumulator. So we load the value from the stack. 12-bit uh, address. 12-bit. We do the AND, and overflow is set according to the result of the operation. How does AND possibly overflow? 
Sign extender to 16 bits for storage in the accumulator. Does this mean that negative values overflow? Let's just, for the sake of sanity, use exchange to store the thing back into the back onto the stack. Okay, that's straightforward. Or the AGC does not have an instruction for ORing values in memory. What it does have is an instruction for ORing values from a I.O. port. Luckily, uh, QL and A maybe just L and Q actually are available in uh, as IO ports. So in fact, we can do a similar piece of code. We load one value into A We load the other value. Uh, on, let's get this all right. We load the other value into L. No, we can't do that because that modifies the thing. Modifies the uh, the value being read. Okay. We load this value into L destroying the value on the stack, which is fine because we're going to write it back. We load the constant into A. We do the OR and we read, we write it back from A Flow set result the operation. If the source is a 16 bit Q register, L is not a 16 bit register. Full value, okay. Uh, that could overflow. And we should be able to do the same thing for AND using RAND. It has nothing to do with random numbers or objectivism. Let's try that. That's and, that's or, that's for XOR. I never got around to implementing not. Add constant. You. Uh, Two five one. Two arch logic op. Uh, right, this is exactly the same thing but this time it's taking a value from the stack. And we're just going to copy the same code. And in with a slight alteration, let's see. Like so. So we pop once and then the then modify the result without popping. Without popping or pushing. So that's a pop. Because we are t uh, we are consuming two values of the stack and then pushing one. So effectively we are just consuming a single item. Uh, 
let's try that. Required extend. Extend. Okay. Poked disky. Run. Has not helped. Done. So disky set raw key code. Are we literally doing the VR oring? So it's a bitwise or so it should be ignoring the uh, all the ones complement stuff. So address may or may not be negative, but we don't care. Sign is positive, left is positive, right is positive. Okay, let's bench test this. Opcode. Um, Set raw up code. Okay, to run. Okay. Now let's take a look at our workspace and see what we've got. Uh, okay. I, to be honest, I do not know whether this debugger is. doing the right thing here, but that doesn't look right to me. Can I get binary out of this? Uh, format letters are octal, hex, decimal, half word, X. I would expect to see the bottom bit zero. Is our multiply broken? I have a feeling it could be. So we load one. Yeah, yeah. We we get one. We do the multiply with C nineteen, which is minus two four two four eight. Okay, so here is our multiply. C19. Seven seven FF, really. Really. It's getting out my calculator. Two O four eight negative hex is F800, so that, well, in this, on this machine, in two's complement, with 15 bits, it would be 7800, but that's suspicious. Can I get this to decimal? Uh, 
Okay, so So in one's complement, what we're looking at is this is 2048. In one's complement, it would be this. In two's complement, it would be. Seven eight zero oh, oh. zero, so seven eight. It would be this. What we've got is seven oh, 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 f f. So seven seven f f. Is that 2048 minus, is that, that's minus 2047. In two's complement. Where is our deck construction? It's in the pseudo op bit. Uh, deck. To embed a single precision constant, it assembles as one 15 bit words. It's the same as two deck. It has. Um, I have a feeling this could be a Yule bug, but that was a 9.3F, so test and proceed. So 9.3F. I'm uh, just trying to figure out where that actually lives in the binary. So that's 93F is 127E minus start address of 0800 is not there. Uh, Contains no decimal point. Applied B minus twenty eight is added. I have a feeling deck might just not work with negative numbers. What's the description of oct? An octal constant places a fifteen bit word number up to five digits. Okay. Uh, right, I'm going to do a thing which I should have done before, which is to add a helper and the purpose of this is to allow is to give only one place we have to change when doing this stuff. So oct percent o wow. And let's see if it likes octal better than it likes uh, decimal. So again, this all boils down to 
Um, the fact that this machine was designed for numerical computations using, you know, decimal values. Um, so it's primarily arranged around dealing with numbers that mean things and have units rather than just uh, integers. So having all your values being minus one to zero decimals, not floating point, fixed point, with a constant scaling factor, actually makes a whole lot of sense given what they're doing. But I think it might be upsetting us. I did discover that the AGC was used in things that weren't Apollo. I found a f reference to a fly-by-wire aircraft, which used one. It completes had a it had a disky in like a uh, behind a hatch somewhere in the back of the uh, plane, um, and also in a remote operated submarine. And, um, But given the enormous cost to them, which I don't know what it is, but they were all handmade and enormously complex. Do seven. Ooh, that's not right. That's not right at all. Uh, Does ah unsigned? Let's try that. Okay, 5400 looks suspicious, but I don't see I, our weird numbers, so maybe it's going to work. Poke the disky, run. Uh, I've got to actually... Yep, run. Nope, still wrong. Though so maybe that wasn't the issue at all. Not sure where it's getting its value from. Oh, the multiply, of course. Uh, No, actually, it's, it's this. Yeah, um, I'm probably going to need to call this a night and complete the rest of it tomorrow because I'm definitely losing focus. As you can probably tell if you're actually trying to listen to what I'm saying. Uh, X10. I do not intend to do these live streams, not live streams, live coding sessions on a terribly regular basis, but after doing the compiler, I suddenly realized how good a match Calgol was for the AGC, which I've been reading it, reading about anyway, after watching Curious Mark's videos on the AGC restoration. And I got intrigued by the architecture, which is crazy. And I like that sort of thing in a computer system. That is still 77FF, and my C19 is a negative octal number. Hey, if, if Yule doesn't want me doing 
if yours not turning uh, negative numbers into valid one complement one's complement number numbers, let's just do it for you. So this is going to be four zero zero zero. So that sets the sign bit and hopefully generates a valid one complement number. Let's take a check our mull. So C9 is zero. That wasn't what I expected. And yeah, multiplying by zero gets zero, so did that truncate it? This is, wait a minute, that is zero. C9 is zero. Yeah, that would be a good idea. is right that's what I would expect a one's complement number to be so what's a is overflow what's L yeah that's kind also kind of what I would expect it to be the the top bit set means that's an overflow condition. So when we store it into S1, what we actually get is this. Which is what we expect from multiplying 1 by that. OK, so let's try uh, this program. Poke the disky to wake it up and run. Intriguing. We still have nines here. These are eleven and twenty one, which is eight and And where is 21? 8 and 5? And the flickering up here is because our program is continually resetting. Which until we actually, if you actually want to play a game, we'll have to do something about that. Try this and see what that, what that does. Oh yeah, we don't have empty statements yet, so. Yeah, we are still resetting. Something is wrong somewhere and I don't know what it is.
So looking at our code, here is our second quarter disk. Here is our multiplication to C19. C19 contains this octal value. Let's have the calculator again. Octal 44000 in hex is 4800, which is what we expected. And uh, let me try running the Pi peripheral again, because that will actually set the, and us change the program to something with numbers on it. Let's try that one. Run our test program, poke the disk key. So it cleared this one this time. It didn't clear this one. Yeah, okay. I bet I know what's happening there. And the reason why it hasn't cleared that one is because uh, that is this digit here. So clearing it involves setting all the lower bits to zero. So this is actually negative, uh, negative one, this value. And we're not going to get there by multiplying this. So we are just running into plain and simple issues with the sign bit getting in the way of arithmetic. So what we have to do is Just, I think, just to do it the old fashioned way using repeated code. like that. And we get a segmentation fault. This is actually the first time I've used a subroutine inside another subroutine. So let's actually just push value that should work but it has optimized away everything pos everything useful for debugging So arch push value is actually loading the contents of a word in the workspace. So it will always be a var. Um, let me just change this to not do any optimization. I hope that makes a difference. Okay. So the symbol is, that looks kind of valid. So .var .sub. Oh, wipe is not owned by anybody. 
Why is wipe not owned by anybody? This creates a subroutine. Subroutine's parent is this. Uh, do we, where do we add it to the symbol table? Where do we add it to the symbol table? I know we are adding subroutines to the symbol table. Otherwise we wouldn't find it. Oh, new ID adds it to the symbol table. Okay. Ah, right. Wipe is not a variable. Wipe is a subroutine, which is not the same thing. And the reason why it's crashing is we're trying to push the value of a... We're trying to push a push the value stored in a subroutine. That makes absolutely no sense, and I don't know why it's doing it. Okay. So this is going to just delve a bit into compiler debugging. What are we doing? And where are we? This is all the wipe instructions. So what we've got here on the left is all the tracing by uh, the, the Bison parser as it parses things, which I'm going to use to try and figure out exactly where it's going wrong. I know what it's doing. I know what it's doing. It's... Ooh, I don't know if there's an easy fix for this. So what's happened is... No, we have a rule no, in which call subroutines where if it sees an ID that already exists followed by a parenthesized list of things, then it must be a subroutine call. We also have a rule that an L value can consist of a, uh, an ID that already exists followed by a square brackets. So it should have read the old ID. We should be able to see that here. Yeah, it's read the old ID and stacked it. It's read the... It's read the ID and stacked it. It's in state 38, which is state 38. Okay, it has actually decided this is an argument list. So what's actually going wrong is line 339 of the parser. It 
，哎。So this is kind of what I expected. We got here from line two one three, which is an L value. From line two four nine, old ID. Two seven four. Argument list. Yeah, I think it is clearly trying to use wipe here in the context of a variable. But I don't know how it's getting there. So this is... This is here. So here's, here's the sub, here's the ID. It's just created a new ID. Yep, new ID. Uh, and then we go through the uh, the actual subroutine definition itself. And eventually we will see a red token. Uh, this is the, the parameter thing. Next token is ID. Open parentheses, yeah, it's here. Oh, it's here. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I should fix that. We should only, well, you shouldn't be able to use subroutines there at all. Uh, there should be a type check for it. Um, and uh, we really shouldn't add this to the symbol table until the end sub gets hit. That still fails. Why is that failing now? Parameters, turns into a parameter list. Parameters are the things when sub in subroutine definitions. Apparently it works now. Weird. Very weird. Anyway. Poke the disky, run. Okay, it has successfully cleared the disky. Good. This is a yeah, this is actually genuinely a really good start. Why it hasn't set... Oh, yeah. Uh, no way, that still should have set that register. Um, I think this is more reset timer issues. So I believe that we should see... Yeah, this flickers occasionally. So the fact it says 04 is a bit disturbing. Okay, anyway, I am going to commit this.
push it and I believe uh, hmm. yeah okay I seem to have screwed up my github repository but let's add But I can do that. Um, and I think I will try and tackle the reset issue tomorrow. We are generating pretty good code. Well, no, it's terrible code. But we are generating capable code that is actually doing what we wanted. The ones complement stuff is freakish. Yeah, each of these wipe calls is actually turning into a reasonably small number of calls, of instructions, which is nice. Yeah. I might also need to do some experimentation with one's complement arithmetic in this thing, just to see if it works the way I thought it does. So, for example, taking this value and actually negating it using the the actual negate instruction and seeing if this matches my expectations complement. No, that, that does not. Uh, okay, so subtracting from zero, there's probably a negate instruction somewhere. Or you could simply load zero and in and do a subtract. That'd be three instructions. Yeah. I'm kind of tempted to do that now, actually. Let's do that now. I Calgol does not use single equal signs anywhere. F thirty one assignment are colon equals, comparisons are double equals. Right, here we go. Code F31. So there are no parameters. So we just save Q. Uh, we load our constant, stack it. So our, we have 0800 in A. Uh, Yeah, we write it to i, we load it out of i, we load our zero, we do the subtract and a contains, huh, okay. Uh, right, I was in fact completely and utterly wrong. I should have tested that ahead of time. Uh, the um, uh, Yoyul was actually doing exactly what it should have been, and I was an idiot. Still, it's nice to know that things are proceeding as normal. Because we did this refactor, this now becomes easy to put back to where it was. Uh, and in fact, since we gave up on trying to do negative numbers, this should now work a lot better. poke the disky, run it without throwing my mouse over the table, 
do the right command. There you go. Blank disk key and a 34. Good. Good. I am still very curious to know why the, uh, that one's complement number did not have the bit pattern I expected. That was not how I thought one's complement worked. And let's push that. You know what? Three, four, one, two, and where are we going to put it? Let's put it in reg just a one. That's 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So this needs to go into disky register six. Let me get that the other way around. Six, seven, and eight. Six, seven, oops, that's not right. Oh, one, two, three, four, just the way we like it. And we can also do, uh, we can do signs. So the sign in 15 equals zero. If value is less than zero, then sign equals one. Value equals minus value. And we don't want to use positive, we don't want to use pluses, so we just want the one minus bit which goes into digit 14 on 6, digit 14, and just this one. So that will actually display a negative number now, I hope. Comp greater than const. And uh, did I implement a? I'm sure I did a CCS. There's one. That one there. Oh, comp equals const. Okay. So this is actually going to be pretty similar code. Uh, if the thing we're comparing against is zero, then we just need to we just need this bit. And you got positive. So yes, greater than zero is true. Zero. No, it is not greater than. And all the rest are falses. If we are comparing with an actual value, then we need to do the subtraction. So, yeah, it's all of this again, and in fact, that can go here, I hope, and all the others will be the same code, so it may actually be worth trying to refactor that. Put 
over the disk -y. run. And uh, that's not right. Intriguing. Let's just try a positive number again. Because, because this could well be negative numbers making all the signs go funny. Run. Well, now we get a... Why is... Why are we getting a negative sign there? Sign is zero. Okay, the comparison is wrong, that's why. Did I get the order of the operations correct? Greater than zero. 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 A greater than zero, zero, less than zero, zero. So am I doing this the wrong way round? It is comparing Ah, right. No, not right. Uh, it reads the value out of the, the memory location. It then diminishes it, as described earlier. But then the jump happens on the original values. The original value, so the diminishing is irrelevant. So over here is the compiled code for doing this. Uh, so here is our if statement. We, uh, if the val, we load the value, we stack it, we unstack it. If it is greater than zero, then we follow the true path. Greater than zero. I think this is another front end bug. Because this stuff is painfully hard to get right. Uh, what happens is that the back end only has to implement greater than and less than. And all the other operations so that is less than or equals to, greater than or equals to, and comparing with constants in any order are synthesized. So I bet that I am messing some things up. So less than zero is actually going to hit this code, this code path. So the left hand side is not a constant, but the right hand side is. So That is the equivalent of doing a greater than uh, in the other direction. No, it's not. This is the one. So if the left hand side is the constant, then we flip the less than to a greater than and flip the order of the operation so it's valid. And I think the same thing applies here. So this, if the left-hand side is a constant, 
this needs to be less than, this needs to be greater than. Okay. Yeah, arc less than const, less than const. And const. This is going to be false label. This is going to be true label. This is going to be off. Disky, poke disky, run. Okay, that's better. Try this again with a negative number. Poke this key, run. And that's not working. Okay, there's some work to do there. Uh, and actually, I will just try inhibit alarms. Poke this key, run. Yeah, okay. Uh, inhibit alarms turns off all the things like the, the night watchman. So we can actually get stuff done by just doing that. It's cheating. Um, I don't want to like disable bits of the computer, even if it is an emulated computer. Hmm. Okay. Okay, so I need to, I definitely now need to go to bed. I do wonder, I think I started this at about eight, so that's five hours. It seems longer than that. Just wondering how long this is actually going to take. Um, as I said, we have actually broken the back of it. It's now just a matter of filling in the holes and debugging the remaining weirdnesses, such as the whole whatever is going wrong with negative numbers. But the fact that we are actually capable of doing this, this is this is code that's actually doing real work now. And that it is actually working is great. Uh, this shows that we are achieving things. So, I suppose I will not see you tomorrow, but hopefully you will see me tomorrow or in about five seconds. Good night. Good morning. It is now the next day. I have coffee. Let's get this done. So the way I left it either last night or several seconds ago is most of the code works. We have a problem with negative division. Our program is capable of writing to the disky. So we need to tackle what's going on with the negative division. Once we've done that, I think we're pretty much good to actually go ahead and write the game. Uh, but before I do that, let's actually just go through and write the code to actually place numbers on the disk in the right place. Uh, while making coffee, I did actually tackle the, uh, I did actually add else support to if, so that will help although not here. So register one is going to be this row, which is 11 to 15. Digit 11 to 15 is uh, six, seven, and eight. Yeah, that's, that one's correct. And exit. And if, if register is two, then it's going to be the the register below that, which is 21 to 25. Oh, pants. Ah, uh, okay. This is problematic. Uh, we cannot update digit 25 without also updating digit 31. I need to store a copy of the state of the disk in RAM. 
Blast. Blast indeed. Okay. Uh, fantastic. So what we're actually going to have to do is to store I see if only we had the ability to actually do this multiplication in code. So the whole complex ones complement mess that I went through yesterday is because this causes a sign bit overflow. So there is a way of, to bodge this. It's really nasty. I think we're going to have to. Do I have to? So what I'm thinking of here is changing uh, probably set raw op code so that this maintains a state of the disk key and if you pass in an opcode of say minus one it simply copies the state it already has rather than uh, rather than actually writing the value given so what this would do is uh, maintain an array containing the what it thinks is the state of the disk key Uh, I think that's over complex. Also, actually, updating a value would require us to disassemble the old one, which means more uh, more logical operations. I think we actually have all the functionality to do that. But the main thing it needs is that just passing in a simple address won't work. Uh, the simple prescaled address. We're going to actually have to pass in which word we're going to modify and then construct the address field. So what I'm thinking of here is that we can actually do this by scaling the address by 1024, which doesn't trigger the sign bit and then doing a left shift by one. The AGC's ability to shift is weird. It doesn't have an opcode to do this. And remember that uh, even though, this is the wrong page on this one, even though it's got a double opcode, double is not the same thing as a shift left in one's complement arithmetic. What we actually want is there's a special memory mapped register. So uh, these three, we've got cycle right, shift right, and cycle left. When you write a value to one of these uh, memory locations, the result that actually ends up in that memory location has been shifted. Now there is no shift left, so we would have to cycle left, and it is a uh, it is a fifteen bit cycle, so that what we would do is we can either put the address in the bottom four bits and then cycle right four times, thus ending up with the address at the top, or we multiply the address to shift it up to the left into BCDE and shift left by one and cycle left by one, 
giving us B, C, D, E here. And the sine bit, which should be zero, gets wrapped around to there. Um, I think... I think I prefer the, the multiply and cycle left approach. In order to cycle once, we need to write the value into the cycle register and then read it back out again before we can write it back to the register. So uh, it's, it just reduces the amount of inline assembly if we do a multiplication. Um, and I want this. And I'm also going to need to actually place uh, we wanted cycle left is in octal 22. Cycle left is 22. So let's do that. Yeah, there's always something making it more complicated. It's always more complicated. So load the opcode write it to the cycle left register load the updated value which won't have overflowed because the, the cycle left register is 15 bits wide and therefore cannot overflow, which means it is safe to do TS. Uh, and we're just going to simplify some of the logic by doing this. So data will contain the actual, uh, the lower bits. So we now want to or in the value of Okay, I was thinking of just doing the whole thing in inline assembly, but actually because the logical operation is that weird IO channel based thing, I'm not going to, I'm just going to do it like this. The brute force way. So this should generate the high, uh, the high bits of the address. This will then or in the digit data and then we write it to the IO channel. So this should then allow us to um, and also now we should be able to do fifteen equals one while i is not equal to 13 loop disky set raw opcode i and loop i equals i plus 1. Okay, does that build? Symbol return not found. Right, we haven't implemented this. Uh, so we need to do an early return from a subroutine. There's two norm there's normally two ways to do returns, early returns from subroutines. You can either just omit the return code in where the return statement goes. Uh, if you're on a system like the 8080, then the return is just a ret statement. So you do it there. Or we jump to the existing epilogue. As uh, as our return epilogue is three instructions, we shall actually do do it in line. Uh, oh, symbol return not found. I never got around to adding that to the parser. 
Okay, so so let's do that. Now, where's our call? Emit call. I am very inconsistent about whether I call things emit or uh, otherwise. So return just does this. Add this to the prototype underneath. Let's call here. We need to add the token to the Alexa. Add the statement to the parser. Yeah, return is easy. Okay. Does that symbol return is not used but not defined as a token? Let's add it as a token. Okay. That's our generated code, which may even work. And now we want to step through and test it. So we want to, we are interested in disky set or opcode, which is F2. GC break F2, poke the disky if I can say found it. Okay. We load our parameters as before. Right, we load the address. Here's our inline assembly that the bit we actually care about. We write Cecil. And then we do the multiplication by 1024. Giving us 1800 in L, which is hopefully what we expected. So that then writes it to the op variable. We then load op back. This we're now into the inline assembly. So 1800 is in A. We store it to SIL, and SIL now contains, if I type it correctly, 3000. Is that what we wanted? Hex 1800 times 2. Got the pocket calculator out again. 1800 times 2 is indeed. 3000. So uh, make sure we have the right value in A. Yep, that's correct. Okay, let's just now what's that done on our disky? Uh, why do we have 04 there? Do I still have my negative number in the... No, we don't. Okay, that should have actually done one, two, three, four. So it's still not right, I believe. We also should have hit disky set raw opcode way more often than we did here. We hit it like twice. Fantastic. Once, twice, three times, three times. So is our loop wrong? Is 
So this is our set raw op code. Here we do the shift and we write it into the workspace variable, into op. We load op, we load sign and shift it with multiplication, store it onto the stack. We load left and shift it and store it onto the stack. We load right and shift it and store it onto the stack. We Ah, uh, no, we don't shift right. So uh, now we're just going into the ors. So we load right. We store it onto the stack. We load that into L. We load the next thing we want to sh uh, we want to or together. We do the IO channel read and or. We now have the result in A. We write that to the stack, load that into L. Yeah, okay, that, that looks all reasonable. So is our loop disky clear? Is our loop wrong? So I think this may be the first time that we've actually done a loop against a constant that wasn't zero. Here, if i equals not equals to 13, and it's possible that i managed to break something. So, here we set up our i to hopefully 1. C9 is 1. C9 is 1. Here we do our actual loop. We load i and we stack it. We load our constant into L. We load the stack constant we want to compare against. We do the subtract. And then we have our CCS followed by four jump instructions. So we have positive or negative wait a minute we want to compare against zero right we are doing a yeah we are doing a comparison against a constant so once we do the subtraction the result will either be zero or not zero and that's what we care about so why are we using CCS and not BZF? So equals constant. We should be using BZF here. So I think this is just wrong. So if non-zero, zero, non-zero, zero, zero, I don't know. Well, we, we could totally be using uh, BZF here. Uh, but this is not working. Something is not working correctly. So anyway, let's take a look at the code again. So this is non-zero. So that is the true case. Oh, I also came up with a way to do multiple labels at the same time. which I believe I may have just gotten wrong. Yes, I have. That's what's wrong with it. It's my multiple label code. Okay. Which I did offline over coffee. So what I was doing here is if you, tr uh, we have the problem where every label has to have a instruction attached to it. Otherwise, YAAGC crashes. So if you emit two labels in a row, then obviously they can't both have instructions. So what I did was I uh, emit a just an, equi an, a, 
an equality assignment to say that the two labels are going to be the same. So before we update the label, we say that the old one is the new one. Yeah, yeah. I think this may be interacting poorly with label aliasing. Because if you omit the actual label followed by a label alias, yeah, I'm, go I'm going to have to go back to my horrible supro hack because we actually have to omit the, you know, the label itself. If there is a label set subrow, then force it to be omitted. I believe that may also be another Yule bug, to be honest, because x19 is x is defined to be x20, x20 is defined to be x18. No, actually, that's, that's completely valid. x18 is a real thing, but we are never actually emitting the label here. Okay, now what we've got is x19 is sub row and so is set to be this location. Okay, let's try this. Right, okay, that works. So now we need to start actually creating our disky buffer. And our disk key contains twelve words of data running from one to twelve, so we need thirteen here. So the old data is going to be disky buffer address. The sign bit we're just always going to update. So if left is not minus one. Then uh, then we want to we want to pull the old value out of old data. No, actually, let's just do if, yeah. If left is minus one, then uh, then we want to mask off the value we're actually looking for, which is five ones and zero, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. Else left equals left times 32. So this is just going to pre-scale left. If left is minus one, we use the value from the old data, otherwise scale it. And likewise, we do right. Uh, 
and likewise we do sine. Sine is not plus minus one, then sine equals data and v. Else sine equals sine times 1024. So all we do here now is we all together the address part, uh, sine, left, and right, which have all been scaled. We write it to the disk key. And then, very important, we update our buffer with the cached value. Arch dereference. Uh, we are loading from an array, from a pointer for the first time. So what this does is it dereferences the thing on the stack, and we know how to do this uh, using the index statement followed by a CA0. However, we do know that index does not like uh, addresses with offsets. So we're actually going to uh, load it into A followed by index A followed by CAE0. So that should have read our value and it's came out of memory, therefore TS is safe. Followed by TS to write the result back onto the stack. Total stack change is none. We will actually do a pop and a push just to make it explicit what's going on. Plus, uh, there will be other stuff we'll be doing with pop and push later. Maybe, probably not. Essentially, what we would do there is uh, emit um, annotations to the people optimizer to say that we have popped this value of the stack. It is never going to be touched again. So the optimizer would be allowed to do more optimizations. Okay. So our disky set raw opco is huge. Uh, yeah, we're comparing against minus one in the most, in the worst way possible. Here is where we're oaring everything together. So we are actually loading everything onto the stack and then oaring it. That's not right. I mean, it'll work, but it means it's everything's right associative. So we actually want, ooh, I never got around to adding my logical operators to the precedence table. That would be why. What precedence do these things have? Uh, or and left. Calgol precedence is mostly stolen from C and is like C's is incredibly unintuitive. Okay, that should be better. Right, uh, we are now, here's our scaling, here's our oaring. So we start with op and then we or in sign and then we load an or in left and then we load an or in right. This is all terrible. And uh, here is where we actually write to the disky. Here is where we write back to the, is this line of code here. So we load address, stack it, uh, 
C3 is going to be the symbol referring to disky buffer here. Uh, we can, yeah, we could use index to generate this code, but the code generator doesn't know how. So yes, we load the address of disky buffer. We add on the offset. Uh, we now load op. We do the index to write. Okay, but does it work? Then we should see no change. Poke the disky, run. We should see no change, I said. Fantastic, what's going on here then? This is the first time we're using and, so possibly that's gone wrong. Possibly our conditionals here are wrong, yeah. This seems plausible. Those nines indicate set bits, and I think set bits come from... Yeah, let's try that. Okay, that's better. That is what we expected. So now we've done this, we should be able to start work on actually setting our values. So if we are writing to register two, which is digits 21 to 25, What we do is the, uh, do I want 21 to 25, we want register, we want address three left hand bit only. And the right one is left unset. So we pass a minus one in there. So this would be two, two, three. And what goes in five? Uh, I think I don't think I've got that right. Four, three, two, ah, one, zero. And the sign bit, we were looking for the negative bit. Two minus goes at address four, which is this one. We do that. Okay, let's try this. Two comma, two, three, four, five. Poke the disky, run. Okay, um, uh, we've just managed to flip the top two bits. Yep, what, why? But other than that, it's worked. Right, register three. The, this is the one at the bottom of the disk key. It's in 31 to 35, which is... Uh, addresses one, two, and three. So it's the same pattern that we used for the first one. Three, four, one, two. Uh, not and minus one because this shares with this. And the sign bit is in three minus is in register one. So sign goes here. Right. Register four. Now register four is going to be 
our prog up here, which is M1, M2. It's only two digits wide. So this is straightforward. It's address 11 with no sign bit. Uh, five and six are going to be the uh, verb and noun respectively. So V1, V2 is registered, is address 10, uh, N1, N2 is register 9, and the sign bit is unused throughout. So that's straightforward. 10. Nine, okay. So, is this going to work? 6, 7, 8, 9. This set to register. Uh, 1, 1, 2, 2. Uh, I actually don't want to use... I'm looking for unique sequences. 3, 2, 4, 3. Right. Moment of truth time. Fire up the simulator, poke the disk key, and run. Okay, that's not right. We've got 01234, which is correct. We've got 02345, which is correct. We've got 6789 with no O. That is not correct. 6789, register 3. So the top digit is not being placed in the right place. So this is the first time we're actually reading a value out of old data. In fact, that's ended up as zero. Or possibly uns... Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, so we're passing minus one into set digits, which is then using the lookup table. So what we're actually going to have to do is, if left is not equals minus one, and if so that if the user has passed in minus one to either of these, we don't do the conversion from uh, a numeric digit to the the video RAM character code. Poke the disk key, run. That's interesting. I wasn't expecting that. So what's gone wrong here? If if left is not minus one, this should be this is exactly the same code we've got up here, so Disky set register, that's that. Disky set digits. So, what are we doing? We load left, we stack it. We load our constant, we put it into L. We load the thing off the stack, we do the subtract. Uh, 13 is our false case. 14 is our true case. So 13 Wait a minute, this is wrong. There should be a label immediately after the condition. equals const. There should be a label 
A uh, true label should have been emitted directly here, but it hasn't. It's just gone straight into code. Why has it done that? Uh, so, I bet that what's happened is... There's inline assembly immediately following the, uh, the equals const, and the inline assembly is not honoring the label. So the label is getting emitted after the inline assembly. So 13 is the true case, which is going here, though it should be here. Right. That's straightforward. Because we have to do this bit like manually. So if there's a label, put it there, otherwise um, otherwise just emit spaces. So where is our... I can't find it. Disky set register, disky set digits we're looking for. Here we go, x13. So that should have put us in the right place. So after the inline assembly, we then jump to the exit, the exit label for the conditional, which is X12. X14, which is the false case up here, is an alias for X12. And then we have X12 immediately afterwards. Okay. Now let's try it. Poke the disk key, run. Good. Got 06789 here, but however, these are zeros and they should not be zeros. This looks like I am reading the wrong digits. Yes. That was getting the highest, the most significant digits from the decimal value rather than the least significant digits of the decimal value. Put the disk key, run. There you go. We have successfully updated the disk key with the right numbers. Good. All registers in the disk key can be set. Now we have to deal with negative numbers. Disk key, poke the disk key, run. So you see, this has, this has gone wrong and it's managed to write a whole bunch of, it's managed to light a whole bunch of alert lights. We have gimbal lock. Uh, this means that the surprisingly cheap uh, inertial uh, guidance unit in the LEM has been pointed in a direction that it couldn't, uh, that doesn't work with, the gimbals have all locked together and now the spacecraft does not know which draw it's pointing. They could have avoided this by adding an extra gimbal to the system, but they didn't, which is very odd. Uh, our altitude is too low and our velocity is too high. This will be, I know what's going on here. I think I know what's going on here. Um, I think the value is out of range, which is then causing overflow and possibly reading garbage here. I bet what's hap I bet that what's happening is the sign is not what I expected. All right, let's go here so that the first call to disk set register gets the negative value and step through it and see what it does. So disk set register, gigantic, gigantic subroutine. Okay, 
break f11 run. So we load our parameters. Okay. Uh, we That's interesting. Why? So index q c a naught load one parameter, load second parameter. Okay, now we're getting on to the actual code. This is comparing sign and value. Oh yeah. Okay, we're we're signing sign we're signing zero to sign, um, and then we do the value comparison here. So here is where we assign to assign zero to sign in our stupidly complicated fashion. Now we are testing the sign of value. So value is that which is I assume the correct negative number we go to the true case meaning that it is less than zero which takes us to here now we set one to sign Yeah, C13 is one, stack, unstack, assign to sign. So here is our workspace. So uh, zero, one, two, sign is now one, the sign bit is set. We now need to invert value by subtracting it from zero. So load value into A. Stack it. Uh, load our constant, which is zero. Perform the subtraction. The result in A is 04D2, which I can calculate again. 4D2 in decimal is 1, 2, 3, 4. Right, that has done the right thing. That has done the right thing. So we then write it back to value and then proceed with the rest of the code. So So we are now actually following the same logic as the positive case. We know that value cannot be negative, therefore, what's different? The only thing that's different actually is that sign is one. So when we or in sign, are we somehow managing to mangle the resulting opcode? I can't think how. Okay, well, let's see what we get to disky set raw opcode then. Uh, actually, yeah, disky set raw opcode. Break F2. Run. Okay, push parameters. And our 
state looks like ooh uh address six sign one left hand digit garbage right hand digit six d I'm pretty sure that's not a valid uh disky character code yeah that's way too high okay that is obviously completely bogus so let's go look at disky set digits that's f9 push parameters These are negative. Why do we have negative digits there? But we know that value is positive because we tested it. Unless this is failing to write back correctly. Let's get back to disky set register then. And in fact, we can break at uh, we did actually check to make sure that the the workspace value is correct. It is the positive one two three four value. XMT run. So, can we get decimal out of this? Uh, apparently, we can't. Um, that's not right. Have I been hit by the dreaded uh, TS is skipping the next instruction on overflow issue? So we do the subtract. The value in A is 042D. We then overwrite the value with the unchanged one. Uh, we are reading rather than writing. Yeah, okay, what's happened here is that our subroutine is yeah. We are actually completely forgetting to write the value back to memory. That won't help. And because we've done a subtraction, overflow might be set, so we use exchange, which ignores overflow. Okay, that should work better now. So let's poke the disk key. Fantastic. We have a negative number. Good. Right. This is a milestone because this means that we have enough logic in place to actually start writing game code. Or at least we have enough logic in place to start actually doing game specific stuff. Now, our Lunar Lander game is going to be the extremely simple. Uh, you have a spacecraft dropping in one di in uh, one dimension. Uh, you have an engine. You're accelerating down due to gravity. You need to make sure that when you reach altitude zero, uh, your velocity is below a certain amount. Now, in order to control the engine, the player is going to have to. Uh, operate the game somehow. 
So, what are we going to use as an input peripheral? Well, we are running this on a lunar lander, remember, and lunar landers are intended to be flown by hand. And what they've got is a joystick, because the LEM was fly-by-wire. The astronauts controlled it by using a, a flight stick, which then commanded the computer to uh, operate the attitude thrusters to rotate the vehicle. And as a result, the LEM joystick is actually memory mapped. So, and I, had, I have a, where is it? ACA3. I have a simulation of this using my flight stick, which I have over here where you can't see it. So if I push the joystick, you can see that the ACA3 emulator is noticing the fact. And we can do this in all directions. We're actually only going to use forwards pitch to operate the engine. So we need to read the joystick. To do this, we just read uh, the value out of this memory register. But, and it took me ages when I was investigating this to realize, but you have to uh, enable it first by writing stuff to channel 13. So let us try and read the joystick pitch. First, we need to enable joystick. Uh, we need to enable it by setting the appropriate bits in channel 13, which is bit 8 and bit 9. So I believe in, in their parlance, this is bit one. So one, yeah. uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, two, three, four. No, that's not right. Want that. Uh, load, I, extend right to port 13 octal almost always octal but in this case actually octal so enable joystick Begin an infinite loop. Uh, we want to read the value from register 32 RHCP. I believe I set a symbolic constant for that. Uh, we then want to write it to uh, memory, and I'm using exchange because it might overflow to the pitch. And then we say disky set register one to the value. And let's see how that goes. So, poke the disk key, run, and nothing happens. Now, I have slightly run into this before, where updating the disk key too often can cause it to crash. I don't believe that's happened here, but it should at least have cleared it. Let's just try commenting all this lot out and trying that again. So 
So if it turns out that updating the disk key too often makes it unhappy, that's interestingly different. Right, this is happening because uh, our main subroutine contains no arithmetic operations, therefore there is no stack. So why is something actually referencing S1's stack? Uh, because we are calling a subroutine, therefore we are passing the pointer to the parameter block. But we only need to do this if we are passing parameters. Yeah, so... If sub input parameters is not zero, and that will also generate better code. Okay. Poke the disk key and run. Yeah, uh, I think that was the, that I'm simply updating the disk key too often. Let's enable the joystick and make sure that didn't have an effect. Poke the disk key, run. Why is the standby light lit up? Probably because this constant offset is incorrect. I think it's like this. I think that bit one is this one, therefore bit eight is this one. Because I, I believe that there are some lights connected up to that particular IO channel. Poke the disk key and run. Okay, well, light's gone off which is good. Now, we need to update the disk key less often. I actually thought of this earlier, uh, and in our test framework, in the timer interrupt, we actually diminish a value called clock. I was going to use this to do timings. Uh, so essentially what we can do is we can write a value to clock. Every time of every 40 milliseconds it will be decremented until it hits zero, at which point it will stick at zero. So if we want to do a pause of say half a second, we set it to 12 and then wait until it's zero. However, our clock interrupt is not actually firing for reasons which are not particularly obvious. Uh, but anyway, let us write the code, which is every half second, load value, We're going to wait for 500 milliseconds. Now we do load value into uh, uh, load value into A, transfer into I. Actually, I can just do while i is not zero loop and loop. However, this is not actually going to work. But let's try it anyway, just in case. So here is our main program. We clear the disk key, we enable the joystick, uh, we load the pitch value, hopefully, 
store it into the workspace. Uh, we call disky set register to actually display the value to the user. Uh, we pause and we loop. So poke the disky, run the simulator first, then poke the disky and run. So yeah, we get a zero because uh, that was the pitch. And yeah, if I push the joystick, nothing happens. So let's, so we're going to have to, oh, wait, our timer's firing. Our timer is firing. Why is our timer firing now when it wasn't earlier? So this should actually be working then. So what's in clock? Clock is a lowercase symbol and therefore the debugger cannot see it. So let's change that. Test.agc clock. And clock is defined here. Uh, poke the disky and run. Okay. So clock is a it is set to two. So if we d diminish that, then clock is now one. Can't. is one clock is now that's not what I expected clock minus one is that's wrap round that is definitely not what I expected have I misunderstood how diminish works? Diminish decrements a positive non-zero value or increments a negative non-zero value. If the contents of K is greater than plus zero, it's decremented by plus one. So six would become five. Ah, plus one decrement to minus zero. I know what's happening with these numbers. I am... No, actually. So what I thought was, is, is this actually interpreting the, va the bit value of one followed by 14 zeros? as a two's complement number and therefore showing me the wrong num the wrong encoding but i don't think that's happening i think this is interpreting it as a unsigned 16 bit value so i think this is actually a zero but it's not the kind of zero i expected anyway we return from our interrupt we are at x the 53. We should at this point be spinning, waiting for. Uh, yeah, we're in pause, spinning, waiting for the uh, clock to be zero. So this is the previous value of clock that's been loaded into i. So we are here, we load clock into A, which has overflowed. Uh, yes. The top bit is set. I wasn't aware that could happen. Uh, 
Right. C A E. The overflow is cleared unless K is the accumulator or the Q register. If the source register is 15 bits, it will be signed extended to 16 bits when placed in A. That would contradict this. Have I misunderstood how overflow works? The 16 bit is present, sector detection, yeah, yeah, yeah. When there is no overflow, the 16 bit accumulators duplicate of the sign. Ah! Okay. Okay. Uh, there's, there's not a specific overflow bit. The overflow is detected by the top two bits being different. So as this is a negative number with the sign bit set, then bit 16 is a copy of the sign bit, so that's correct. That's perfectly normal, it hasn't overflowed. Good. So anyway, we write... Uh, yep, we, we write the new value into the workspace. We then loop around again. We have finished our loop, so we return. That's working. That's working, but it's actually not reading uh, pitch values. So I have a feeling I may not be... I did actually make this work in testing. So I do know that the pitch works. Forty-two R C H P. We have set this correctly. Okay, that is forty-two. Here we load it, and we'll break 57. So poke the disky, break x57, push my joystick forwards with one hand while typing run with the other. Okay, we should have loaded the value into A, which is zero. I believe that I haven't enabled the joystick correctly. The counts are supposed to update only if RHC counts are enabled, bit 8 of output channel 13 is set, and when the count is requested, bit 9 of output channel 13 is set. And that's actually... Is that... Did that connect to the... Yeah, that has connected. You know what, let's just set lots of bits. That should probably light the standby light again. And this has not done anything. So that should have actually called this key set register and displayed a value, even if it's zero. So you can see there's a pause when I continue. This is the half second delay. 
So it is actually cycling through and it's calling disky set register and something should be happening. So our disky doesn't look like it's crashed. So why hasn't anything appeared on the screen? So this should just count. Okay. We have a program. So we know that our program is capable of writing to the disk key, fine. But when the but we're not reading the pitch from the joystick. Um, okay, so our joystick port is at 42 octal, which is in hex 22, decimal 34. Push joystick, receive no numbers. Fantastic. Okay, uh, I did actually make this work in testing, so I do not know why it's no longer working in testing. Output channel 13 set. That is output channel 13. Enable joystick is at F30. F30. Are we actually writing the right value? F30 is here. That would be 380 with our various bits set. We do actually we do actually appear to be writing the correct value to the joystick enable port. Okay, um, I am going to uh, investigate this offline because this bit is not interesting to watch. So back in a moment. Well, that was awful. I've made it work. You see, if I push the joystick forward, there is a number appearing in the disky. If I pull it back, there is another number. So I stepped through virtual agency itself and did a bunch of debugging there, and I discovered a whole slew of different problems. One of them is that the uh, the RHCP memory address only gets updated with the value corresponding to the joystick position each and every time you write to channel 13. Uh, it does not get updated in real time, so I can't just enable the joystick and then let it run. I have to call this every time I want to access it. Other than that, it's just a memory location. The other problem is that I'd misunderstood the way that virtual AGC is configured. Now, uh, the disky and the joystick are two different servers which connect to the main AGC simulator. And you have to specify a port number that they connect to or use the default. And I didn't realize that they have to use different ports. Normally, you can have multiple clients listening, multiple clients connecting to the same port on a server and everything works fine, but not this case. 
And this is why I was having so much trouble making the disky work reliably, because every time I started the simulator, the ACA server running the joystick and the disky server running the disky would fight for the same port. So sometimes uh, uh, the ACA would win and the disky wouldn't work, but I would be getting joystick information, which I could see in the debugger, and that was dead confusing. Sometimes the disky would win, but then we wouldn't get any joystick data. So that's now done. So look, numbers. And it's all happening in real time and everything is fine. So now we can actually write our game. We've got all the pieces, all the logic. We can make this work. So we're going to want a game loop. We're going to want several game loops, actually. But let's just start with the outer game loop where we um, are going to, we're going to run the game loop every tenth of a second. So that's every hundred milliseconds. So that's roughly every four clock ticks. So ticks equals three. This is just so it runs at a consistent speed. And then we write that to clock. Um, and then we one game tick. And then after we finish the game tick, we then wait for the clock to expire. This means that one game tick can actually uh, take as much time as it likes up to, of course, slightly over a tenth of a second and everything is fine. So what do we do inside game tick? The first thing you want to do is to, is to read the joystick and figure out what the, uh, how much thrust the user is giving our virtual spaceship. So we read that. And just so the user gets some feedback, we're going to stick this in the uh, the prog field up here, which is one, two, three, register four. So we do this, and hopefully this should work. Symbol I not found, that's here. Uh, what was I? Oh, yep. Uh, yeah, I just want to do var i fifteen equals one. Actually, no, let's do that bit properly. program we can run it so we poke the disk a bit just to make it connect and we have read a thrust value into prog push the joystick forwards there we go and of course there is no neg there is no minus sign for prog but that will do just fine so I uh, now have some game state what state do we have? We have the player's altitude, which is going to start at 1,000 meters, but we're going to scale everything by a factor of 10 to give a little bit more precision. We have the, the vertical velocity. We're going to be nice and start that at zero. We have the amount of fuel, which is 1,000 units. So every clock tick, we want to display the thrust value, the altitude, undoing the scaling, the 
vertical velocity. I'm doing the scaling. And the fuel. Now we want to make sure that if the user has run out of fuel, then no thrust is available. And every clock tick we update the altitude with the velocity. And let's have negative velocity for down just to be a bit more, you know, sciency. And every clock tick our velocity decreases by, uh, we've scaled by a factor of 10, so that's actually 10 centimeters per clock tick. We have approximately, uh, we actually have three 40 second clock ticks. So, so we actually, each clock tick is 120 milliseconds so we have 8.3 a second. So uh, we want like an actual physical value. We're going to have one meter per second squared, which is about a tenth of Earth's gravity, uh, divided by uh, eight. Yeah, if we just subtract one that will give us a fairly low gravity. That'll be fine. This is not scientifically accurate. Let's poke the disk E, run. Okay. Now here we can see our velocity slowly increasing. Why did that not start at zero? That's interesting. And that's garbage. Why is our altitude changing when I move the thrust lever? Let's put raw figures here and see if that makes a difference. That sounds like more arithmetic bugs, sadly. Well, this is minus nine five four six. Definitely minus 9546 for altitude. We've not modified altitude. Altitude is set right there. The fact that that changes is extremely disturbing. Um, I believe that what's going on here is something wrong with actually setting the disk key. So let's change that to three and see if that makes a difference. No, no, it's not. Okay, let's look at the code. Probably a code generation bug. So one game tick. Uh, you don't need to initialize thrust. Here is where we actually read the value. Here is where we uh, cl clear the thrust value if there is no fuel left. Here 
here is where we uh, write to is where we update the disk key with thrust value. Here is where we set the altitude value. The W1 plus 13, W1 is the outer subroutines workspace. Do we actually have enough precision for 10,000? 10,000 in hex. 2710, I think we are fine. Yeah. Well, let's start commenting bits out until something happens. Still nines nine five four six. Interesting. I think we don't have enough precision. My maths were wrong. Okay, what is 10,000 in hex? Uh, 10,000 hex is 2710. That is 0010, 0111, 0001, 0000. That should be fine. Uh, the sign bit is on the left and zero. So that's not actually problematic in any way. That's just reading the wrong value. Does a thousand work? The thing is, we had this working before. We were displaying numbers in all the registers. Okay, a change we've made has broken something. So let's put this back the way it was, put this back the way it was, change this, comment out all of this, and do whiskey set register one, one, two. That works. That works fine. We get the correct values in all the various slots. I wonder if this is because this is reading an up value. It shouldn't be. There is no difference between an up, in CalGoal, there's no difference between an up value and any other global variable. All variables are global. That has read 8200 
instead of 1000. That is still red 8200, but 1234 worked. Did we just get lucky with the with our test constants? I think we did. And it's actually just broken. Wow. 1230. One two zero zero. Yeah, one thousand just doesn't work. Okay, what's going on here? I think this is because we are dividing. One by ten. Okay, this is the horrible AGC division instruction producing gibberish. That's what it is. So the... At least I think it is. So we keep dividing the constant by 10. Eventually we will reach 1. So we divide 1 by 10 here to get the new value and I think that my comparison to make sure it's in range has failed. So if that's correct then setting 1 will also fail. No, that works fine. Does 10 work? I did save that. I did build that. So 10 has produced the wrong result. So have these. But the wrong result is correctly shifted left. Yeah, this is a division bug. So let's create a test procedure. 15 equals 10. RJ in 15 equals 10, RK in 15 equals I divided by J, N sub, test. You know how I said earlier that we'd managed to get all the bits we needed? Uh, that doesn't work. I appear to have been slightly over-optimistic. F thirty four So we low we set up I which is ten. This is the value we're dividing by, which goes into L. We now mask off. Right, remember how I said that I didn't, that I had failed to understand one's complement arithmetic correctly? So I was expecting this mask to uh, take the absolute value, but that's not actually 
what's going to happen. Now this should this should not be affecting this particular situation because uh, all the values are positive. So yeah, it's still 10. Now we do the subtraction. The result is negative zero. We, we've just done the comparison and it thinks the result needs to be zero. So the comparison has worked. So we load zero into A, which is zero. We skip to the end. So we end up stacking it, unstacking it, and writing it to the workspace. Which is our second variable. So that has produced the right result. No, it's not. 10 divided by 10 is in fact 1, not 0. You'd think I would know things like this. So CCS has got, if it's n if the value is negative, uh, so it's positive, zero, zero, positive, zero, negative, zero. So we're going to need our, some more labels, um, label. So label. Positive, zero, zero label, negative, uh, oh, but this is not going to get the sign right, is it? Oh, this is awful. Because this, this is going to... Comp yeah, uh, we need to be able to return either negative 1 or... Negative 1 or positive 1. Can we get that from here? No. This is getting to be way too much code to actually fit in in line. So this is going to need to turn into a helper a, a helper routine that goes in the skeleton. I was really hoping to avoid these, but okay. So what we're going to do is Load the load the constant into L. That's the thing we're dividing by. So the thing we're dividing by. Load the thing we're dividing into A. Call our division helper. And on return from this. Uh, the result is going to be in A. So we can store it, and we're going to guarantee that no overflow happens. So division routine div. How 
do we do this? We need some temporary storage to put things into. So this was why I didn't want to take things out of line. Do we have a way to do we have a nice way to do uh, to get the absolute value of something? I don't think we do. Okay. So, create some temporary variables for the cached value of A and L. We write that back here. So, exchange with div A. Uh, no, we're not going to do TS div A. This has to use L exchange div L. That will corrupt L. We now need to compute the uh, the masked the absolute versions of both of them so we can get the uh, so we can get the uh, the absolute values in order to do the, the actual comparison. So this will load div A and do and branch on it. Uh, we have positive 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 zero negative. negative zero. So these can be no ops. Yikes. Uh, so at this point we want to that's an, that's an extend at this point, we want to load the value in div A. Uh, and negate it by subtracting it from 0. Uh, now we do this, e 0, subtract div A, that's an extend. Uh, that might overflow, so set it to div magnitude A. And then we want to do the same thing for the other one. So if div A is positive, then check the sign of L. If L pause Oh this is awful. Uh there must be a much better way to do this. So this actually divides the AL register pair. Provided we make sure that the thing we're dividing by is 
always going to be smaller than the thing we're dividing, we should be golden. How can we do that? We can Hmm. You see, I would like to just be able to put the uh, the thing would divide the uh, the dividend in the high word, but this produces a single precision output. A in arranger in L. How can we avoid needing to do sign calculations? Well, we can calculate the magnitude of the two variables. Do the comparison. That will tell me if it's going to fail or not. If it does fail, can we do something particularly evil by synthesizing a value for the dividend, which is bigger than the divisor, but will divide into the same result? Are we going to have to alternatively we could just like say that this doesn't work and bodge around it for now, but this is not right. What this is going to do is we're going to end up with uh, developers, developers, no op, no op. So this gives us extend to div l exchange div. Uh, that should be. That is the absolute A and absolute L. So now we can load uh, absolute A, subtract absolute L, do yet another comparison based on A. So a positive result means A is greater than L. So it's safe to do the division. A zero result means the two, th the, the two the divisor and the dividend are equal. This means the result has to be zero div equal. So the simplest one is div zero, where we simply load zero into A and return. The next simplest is div safe, where we load uh, we load zero into A. We can't do that just yet. We load, we use L exchange 
to load the low word of the dividend. I got dividend the right way around. Yeah, the dividend into L. We then load zero into A and actually do the division. Uh, hang on, I've got that wrong. Yeah, yes, we're actually doing A over L. So the thing you want to divide here goes is A, but it goes into L because the divide routine uses an AL register pair. So here we do the division by A. Uh, div A. And this gives us a result in A. So we just stop. Right. Div equal is the case where uh, the the sign uh, where the magnitude of the absolute value of the divisor and the dividend are the same. So the result is going to be either plus one or minus one. And this is actually simpler than I thought. What we do is we load div A We subtract div L. So we're going to see if the values with the signs are the same or not. If they are the same, then they have the same sign, so that we must be returning plus one. Otherwise, we return negative one. So we need some constants. C plus one is decimal one. C negative one is decimal minus one. So C negative one. positive one return yikes okay that did a thing what was the thing it did and run no really run why is that not running uh, that just breaks. Where are we? weird. Right, I believe that what's happened is something, oh. Yeah, uh, I mentioned before that Yule's error handling is a bit not so great. Right. Uh, CCS is not an extend. BZF is an extend. These are constants. Okay. That, this is wrong, but these appear to be right. 
So just double check our program. Yeah, that should be a 10. So we're in div, what have we got? Computing A over L, A. Right, so A and L are both 10. So we're going to store this in div A and div L. Div A is 10, div L is 10. We're now going to take the absolute value. So A is positive, L is positive. We're here. We're now going to subtract. Ah, we didn't set AA and AL. So, I mean, the code is getting increasingly horrible and big. Run. Well, that has actually worked less well. So that should have... We write A to A and absolute A and absolute L. Okay, that looks better. That looks a lot better. I don't know if it's right, but I think that's good enough to keep going with our game. So let's chop these out and put our code back in. Still not right. At least we got a thousand in. Our fuel is showed as correct. Our altitude is not. Our velocity is quite wrong. Okay. Oh yeah, let's check the thrust. Thrust looks good. I mean, it is actually producing like reasonable results. This one still scares me. I think there may be some kind of memory corruption or something. Turn off the debugger. What have we got? Altitude is being displayed wrong. but if we use a constant, we actually get the right value. This suggests that something is corrupting the contents of altitude. So we're gonna to have to go back to the debugger. Did you know, I actually thought this would be a fairly quick thing. I'd completely miss judged the weirdness and complexity of this thing. So what have we got here? We are reading altitude and calling disky set register. And F30. Uh, I do not see a reference to altitude, to be honest. So what is this doing? Load a constant, stack it. Load a constant, stack it. This 
C13 and C29, that's just... C13 is 1. C2, oh, uh... I think I forgot to build it. Okay. So now let's look at our code. One gain tick. Right now it is actually reading altitude. Ah, uh, oh, I know what's happened. I do know what's happened. It is memory corruption. So the first time through, uh, okay, so the first time through, this is going to be D eight O O, which is not what I would expect. Let me take put that into decimal. D eight O O is five five two nine six. Right. What I think is happening is. Disky buffer here is being overrun. It shouldn't be. Because I think this is overwriting altitude, which is next. So this is the main subroutine's workspace. We have written to the disky when we cleared the, um, yeah, that D800 was wrong. We've written to the disky when we call disky clear. So it has initialized the uh, disky buffer here. And we have. what look like valid opcode values. Then we've got 3E8, so I'm pretty sure is a thousand. So we're loading W1 plus 13, so that is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 8, 12, 13. Yeah, okay, we are actually loading 03E8. So where do we get that D8004? This is just W1 plus 13 altitude. Ah, ah, octal everywhere, octal, it's always octal, these offsets are octal, oh, right, that's a decimal constant, that's an octal constant, that's a decimal constant, that's an octal constant, octal, 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 octal. So much octal. 
See that thing about Octal is it to the to the eye it's indistinguishable from decimal. At least with hex you've got like a decent chance that it's got uh invalid decimal characters in it. This is going to be a long video. Okay, let's try that. And run, disky, and run. Right, okay. So what was happening is, is once the offset got above uh, 7, it was just reading garbage out of the wrong bits of memory and we just happened to luck out that none of our constants contained the digits eight or nine otherwise you would i hope have produced an error right okay okay this is worth a commit but i should have been doing a lot more commits uh, let's go back to our game Let's put all this stuff back again. Build, run, turn off the debugger for now. And what do we get? There we go, I seem to have just crashed. Yes, we are descending quite rapidly and we are below sea level. I might want to let's see, scale that up by 10. Uh, this. Yeah, uh, I might need another scaling. I, need, I might need some more scaling. If we assume that we are never going to be above 2,000 meters, then our scaling factor, given that we have 14 bits of precision, that is... 16384. So if we have a scaling factor of uh, we don't actually have enough. So we're going to have to bodge this. We actually want our scaling factor, yeah, to 10 will do. So altitude divided by 10, velocity divided by 10. So we are not actually going to Going to add a extra factor of ten onto the onto sub velocity here. Uh, we also, the idea is that velocity and sub velocity together will be a sort of double precision thing.
we're still decelerating pretty quickly. Also, if sub-velocity overflows, then we are in a world of pain. So we need to deal with this. And we're actually going to have another step there. So if sub-velocity is bigger than 100, then Shift a bit of precision into velocity. Likewise, if sub velocity is less than 100, then velocity then shift a bit of precision into well, I say bit, I mean some shift some precision into the main variable. So what are we doing now? We are slowly accelerating upwards. Why are we accelerating upwards? Interesting. Is that caused by this code? Oh, hang on, we don't want that at all. And in fact, we want this to be a while loop. So uh, once the sub velocity overflows our critical factor, we keep shunting chunks of velocity into the main variable. Okay, that's working. And after a while we should see this. Wait a minute, why? Uh... We should be seeing some velocity there after a bit. Let's just take that off. Yeah. Uh, okay, what? Our numeric range is actually too small. We need those double precision numbers, but uh, that would require reworking a lot of the code generator, and I'm not going to do that. Just absolutely not. I mean, at some point, yes, but not now. But this is actually like behaving. So let us apply some. Oh, 
Let's apply a bit of thrust. So we are descending. Push the joystick forwards. Well, we are gaining fuel, which is a bit weird. Lots of thrust. And our velocity is not changing. Which is what I would be expecting. Uh, I, that's because I forgot to add that on. Right, uh, the reason why... Th uh, yeah, the reason why we were gaining fuel is that when you push the stick forward, thrust is actually negative, but we weren't seeing that happen because there is no minus sign up here. So we are going to uh, simply do thrust equals minus thrust just to get into the right way around. And we don't want to allow negative thrust. So if thrust is less than zero, thrust equals zero. And if So we are slowly descending, joystick forwards, We're losing lots of fuel, our velocity is increasing, we are ascending, ascending more rapidly, and we've run out of fuel. No more thrust, we're in a ballistic trajectory. Uh, we want to use less fuel. So let's give you more fuel there and scale it. We also want to apply a bit more thrust. So so we are descending. Stick forwards. Okay, that worked. I think we want a bit more gravity. Let's try changing that to five, because the player has no way to move down. The only thing they can do is thrust backwards. So, And there's actually a pretty long delay between... Yeah, that's a lot of height. I wonder if I just want to start the lander at like 100 meters. That would give me a lot more space for precision. And we have a... We're now hovering and slowly descending again. I think I need a bit less thrust. The engine is quite powerful. And yeah, let's start at, say, 200 meters. Throttle forwards. We also have a lot of fuel. So this is not going to be a particularly difficult game. I know how to make this more interesting. So we start at a thousand as before, except our velocity is going to start heading downwards at quite a clip. But possibly a bit faster than that. So the player is actually going to have to decelerate pretty sharply. Faster than that.
Yes, this is more like it. And I think we may have just... Okay, we're now going up. So we now have to sort of wait for gravity to bring us down again. Yeah, and we've used 250 units of fuel. So let's just give the player 3,000. Oh, it's a thrust. Too much thrust. Okay, that's reasonably tricky. And we've landed. We hit the ground at a safe speed which was two whatever these are so that that looks like a game all uh, right awesome oh yeah we don't want that testing here uh, we need a bit of game state to go around this there is, so there is actually one more disky thing we need to do which is disky pause for key this is going to wait for a key press. Uh, the way we do this is we read from uh, input channel 15 and it gives you a, a ski code. Ski code? Key code. Um, I believe what you get is zero unless something happens so we do loop uh, as an extend as an read 15 the capital letters as an copy into i if I is not zero, then break. And if what we're going to be using this for is both to uh, is both so that. Uh, the program will start without the player actually falling. And also, once we've detected crashes, we will um, allow them to restart the game. Let's see if this works. Key press, not found. Pause for key. And we don't actually care what the key pressed is. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, normally, I, normally I hammer keys to make the disk key respond, but of course that may, yep. Okay, I believe that works because we started out at a thousand and we haven't, we haven't crashed yet, so... Okay. Now the actual game outer loop is so the reset game altitude equals thousand by ten velocity equals minus one hundred sub velocity equals zero fuel equals three thousand. So the actual gameplay is going to be infinite loop, uh, clear the screen, reset the game, run for one game tick, 
The purpose of this is to initialize the disk key with the game view. Pause for a key press. Then keep going and while altitude is positive, just keep going round the actual simulation loop. Once the altitude has stopped being positive, we then test to see whether the player has landed. Let's have that as an arbitrary thing. Uh, if the velocity is sufficiently low, then uh, uh, let's just display a marker values for the time being. wait for a key press and go round again. So we are descending. In free fall at 100 meters per second and we hit the ground and uh, And we do, in fact, immediately restart. So either the key press was buffered. Yeah, the key, the key press is not buffered. What's happened is that it's not returning zero if there's no key press. So uh, what the documentation here says is that there needs to be an interrupt. Interrupt mechanism incurs a Kylie within YAAGC. Okay, we need to more skeleton stuff. Clock. So we've got two keyboard interrupts. Interrupt five, causing the software to examine the channel. Uh, that's my screen recorder. We're nearly there. We're nearly there. This is the last thing to do. So, uh, zero, one, two, three, four, five, key erupt one. Two key. I think all we need is this. This will diminish the value of key whenever the user presses a key. So in order to wait for a key press, we set it to one and then wait for a zero. Key rupt. Okay, yeah, it is key rupt one we wanted. So pause for key is uh, CAE zero, load to zero, transfer to storage, we can't overflow because it's zero, transfer storage to key, CAE key, uh, that's wrong actually. We want it to be a one. See, I store it to key. Load key. Store it to I. Yeah. While I is not equal to zero, loop. 
let's try that. Um, and also we need to just, I noticed the theme didn't work the way I thought it did. So we're just going to move this stuff into display game state. So that'd be reset game, display game state, one game tick, display game state, and let's give that a try. Uh, 118 syntax error, let's say cow goal error. Yeah, that was complaining because the end sub didn't match the loop. One of the reasons why I picked this syntax is yeah. uh, after working with Ada for a bit, I realized that requiring uh, scope terminators to have the keyword of the scope opening is a really good way to avoid tricky to spot bugs and readability issues. Okay, press the key, we're descending. Wait for us to crash. Okay, 9999 means that, <laughs> 9999 means that we have actually landed because a very big negative velocity means yeah, that should be greater than minus 30. But now we should be able to press the key again. Reset the game, proceed. Okay, start this ending. And we crashed. Reset game, proceed. Okay, that works quite nicely. We want some special effects. So when you've landed, uh, we want to Uh, this is it. Let's just make altitude zero, velocity to be zero. Uh, just, just turn the engines off automatically. Display game state. So that will just show a nice landing display with no embarrassing underground spacecraft. Um, what are we going to do when we crash? We are going to If this will work, I set equal zero loop display game state disky clear equals I minus one. This should give a flashing display disky and just keep the screen blank. Does this work? Okay, this key is connected, we're descending. Yeah. 
kind of more than I wanted. So let's just do that, say, 10 times. Sending. Okay, that looks okay for a crash. Press a key to proceed. Go again. Let's see if I can land it this time. Ah, thrust. Okay, I crashed it. This feels like a game. Okay, you can't use proceed, you have to use a number key. Interesting. So we've actually used most of our fuel decelerating from our entry burn. So maybe I just don't have enough fuel to land now. Get that down below safe value. I think we can do it. I may want to make the landing velocity a bit safer. And we've landed. It's a game. Awesome. Right, I actually do want to just do one special effect. Uh, disky. Now we have some out. Light, here we go. Because we can actually set the light. So it does look like they think that bit one is what most people call bit zero. So Uh, display game state. Far right. Zero. If velocity is less than minus 30, which is our critical value, light equals light or uh, bit three. One o oh, o. Oh. If velocity, uh, if uh, altitude is less than one hundred, then or one o o o o. One o o o o. Uh, now, now this is uh, so we're actually going to be using set raw opcode for this. Light t equals zero. If velocity minus thirty, then uh, oh, 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 o
and if our highlights fifteen equals zero. If altitude is less than one hundred, then highlights equals uh, oh no, I'm 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 just getting myself confused. They will both actually fit in the lower They will both fit in the uh, lower digit space. So this is register 12, nothing, nothing, lights. Let's see if that works. Let's see. Uh, the address is not in reusable memory. The required extend is missing. Um, I bet this is... Uh, yeah, that's trying to load a constant with CAE. Let's see. Fixed. Fixed. Apparently, we haven't used or with a constant yet. Required extend is missing. Extend. And OK, and run it. Why is our altitude? OK, that's an altitude warning. But we're not actually starting at the right altitude. What changed? Have we managed to corrupt our altitude with this? I think we have. Uh, the velocity light should be on, but it's not. That's yet another code generation bug. Yeah, what's going on here? So load our constant. Where are we? Okay, this displays the fuel value, which is here. And so now we go on to dealing with the lights. So load a constant, which is probably zero. Stick it in lights. Load velocity. Compare it with the constant. Subtract it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, positive, zero, negative. Okay, that looks fine. Uh, is it just a simple buffer overrun? Shouldn't be.
I think it might have been actually. And also I think I'm lighting the wrong lights. Uh, the low bit is Vel. And six one six three eight three is the wrong altitude. So, so if I put lots of thrust in and get a velocity down, does the light go out? Yes, it does. Uh, also, um, my velocity, my critical factor is way too big. because I'd forgotten that we weren't displaying the scaled value. See, we landed. Altitude warning is lit. Yes, something is corrupting altitude. But if I take this out, everything is fine. Ooh, that's not right. Let's try taking this out. Yeah. Uh, okay, this is something about writing to uh, Disky segment 12 is making things go horribly wrong. Twelve, eh? Yeah, that's all complete garbage. So what's wrong with 12? This is where we actually call disky set raw op code. So altitude is plus 16. Mm. Uh, yeah. Let's just do that because that will Stick the octal prefix on all our huh, zero zero. Yeah, uh, luckily uh, Yule doesn't care, so we'll just live with that. Because I have a feeling that we may have more base issues. Disky set raw op code. This worries me. I don't think that's a bug, but it's certainly a bug. This should be... Can I get... 
I'm sure that there is a way to persuade uh, printf to put the prefix on O conversions. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. We can. I can do hash zero for that. So, yes, that's done the right thing. Uh, percent O O turn it into percent percent hash O throughout. That didn't do what I wanted it to do. O percent O into percent hash O. That's better. Okay, that looks more sensible. Uh, what's this? That doesn't look right. That does not look right at all. No, that's a zero, that's fine. Decimals. Uh, those are zeros. The amount of workspace for the main subroutine is now 24 octal words. Okay, let's see if that's actually made a difference to the program running. No, it hasn't. You know what, this is... I would call this fixed if it wasn't for this issue. Pro does not seem to trigger an interrupt, I wonder why. Set raw up code. Uh, not that one. Disky set digits. Disky clear. Pause key. Display game state. This one. I want to stick a breakpoint at x fifty nine. x fifty nine. Run. So altitude is currently. W1 plus 15, so let's do 20 W1. So this is the state of our disk key. Uh, address 12, that's decimal, contains the light. So that's uh, 0, 1, 2, 
3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12? Ah, uh, oh, no, sorry. This one, this is one. Uh, the bottommost word is not used and contains garbage. So we set. Yeah, that means 2710 here is our altitude. 2710 to decimal is indeed 10,000. Okay. So we we're now at disky set raw op code. We load our parameters. Subroutine one workspace is undisturbed. Our subroutine two workspace has got register sign upper light upper digit lower digit. We we have loaded A with subroutine one's workspace. That's here. That is wait. Why have we done that? C three. Uh, oh yeah, that that's the address of the the digits storage array, which is this. Um, C is our register, so we add on, so we now have the address of 89, which is this, that's correct. So we dereference it, which gives us E000, which is 6000, which is 0110. E is 1110. It has uh, extended the sign bit into the overflow bit. That's fine. So that has read the right result. One two seven one zero is undisturbed. So we now go through and we uh, we've stored the old data. We look at the sign bit. Yeah, we, we skipped doing anything with the sign bit. Yeah, I don't think there's anything particularly useful here. So let's just skip all the way down to Um, where we do our, we're looking for the right 10, which is this. Uh, there aren't any useful, 
Okay, we just have to skip through this. There aren't any useful labels we can jump to, you see. And I haven't figured out how to actually go to you know, line numbers or anything. Wait a minute, are we here? No, we're not. We're still further up. At some point we reach a right. Okay, we've done the right. Uh, let's just double check our workspace. 2710 is still undisturbed. We're now going to write back to the uh, the array. So C3 should be uh, C3 is the same address of our array. Eight nine is the same address as our array. So we should be updating this value here. And that value should have changed. It is now 6004, and this is undisturbed. Yeah, and uh, nothing has happened. Uh, altitude is still exactly as it was. Calling disk set raw keyboard here has actually made no difference at all to the value of altitude. Is there something else going wrong? What time do we just do that? Start game. No? Nothing. Comment out. Nothing? Really? What's going on? This is really weird. I don't understand what's happening. Make. Okay, that plays. That plays. That does not. Okay, let's try setting it to a different thing. Is it just 
Dress 12 that causes the issues? No. But we called set register and that calls. About one. Okay, I'm actually I have had a thought about what might be happening. So let's take a look at the symbol table, shall we? Right, this is what's going on. Uh, we have our program is too big. We have overrun our ra our ROM bank, and we've spilled into bank three. So if I take this out and then reassemble, we still use a few words from bank three. Uh, I need to figure out the memory map. No, actually, I think we've got far. I think we're fine for memory. In fact, we cannot be running out of code because our main program, the bulk of our main program in the game loop is at the bottom of the program. So if we were running out of space, that wouldn't, uh, that wouldn't work at all. But it does look like this called disky set raw opcode is causing the is triggering the issues. Okay, well the amount of data we've got is actually not terribly significant. W1 here is the biggest piece. Let's just copy I'm just gonna try and diff the two together. And this is going to be a complete mess <coughs> because all my label numbering is different. But let's see if we can get anything at all. <clears throat> Let's actually do that right. So this is bad code. Compile. Let's 
play game state. And down the bottom of it, we can see a called disky set rocky code. So let's copy this into two. Now we comment out this line, recompile, And at the bottom of, yeah, okay, so that's no longer there. And now we compare the two together. Right. So this is the, the only difference in code between the two files. I was expecting more. I was expecting this to allocate a label, but it hasn't. Are we taking too long? Do we need to reduce our frame rate? No. So what's it actually doing? Uh, nothing. It's not running at all. So that I did see this before when uh, the source code was garbled. Uh, the debugger produces these messages when interrupts happen. So this looks like an interrupt happened and then something has gone wrong. Of course, it'd be nice if we had... Let's see, X IP, print IP. It'd be nice if we could tell what the show registers. If I could show, t make it tell me what the uh, what the program counter is. I'm not sure what this is told, telling me. I think this is showing me the log of the the labels it's hit. Show threads? No. Oops, yeah. No. This only implements a subset of the available commands, so info interrupts. Interrupts are allowed. Last ISR is three. Ah, info registers. We're at zero. Why are we at zero? There's a stack. So what?
This does look like a stack. It looks like this is just remembering all the labels it's passed through. So we've been through X22, uh, then we went to X24. Uh, this isn't a real label, remember. Then we jumped to div. So this looks like div 0 is going to X24, which is a re-entrant loop. That's bad. So div 0... Uh, should be returning. Have we corrupted Q? How? Okay, well, that gives us a place to start. So let's try break div zero run. Can't. Okay, that looks wrong. Break div zero run. What's in Q? That looks like an address. Okay, we are at code GC line 291, which is after the div, which is just where we expect it to be. So we store the result in S11. Now we look back and we're at x22 again. Yeah, this is what we... So div 0, 24, x22, x24 again, and then div. So the next time we hit div, Okay, we're here. Div A, Div A. CCS Div A, Div A pause. That should be put us here. Uh, that's died. So what's wrong with this? Give a pause. Uh, okay. Have we hit div a pause before? This smells like another simulator bug. Okay, can't. Run, trace. This is not data. Now, this is not code. 
Uh, I think I think we have hit banking issues. And our code has spilled into multiple banks, uh, except that that bank has not actually been Uh, loaded. So the top address we can get at in Octal is 800. Uh, wait. Right, common fix exists within this area. Fixed fixed exists within this area. So I want one followed by four zeros, which is. Yeah, this look one. The address we're at is looks fine. Symbol. Mbfo. Yeah. Assemble. That's OBF8. Yes, okay. So our, our program stops at OCOO. There isn't anything else there. Uh, so I was working from this document. It said that this particular memory area was directly accessible and requires no manipulation. But there's also a bit elsewhere that there are overlaps. Here we go. Common fixed bank appears at fixed fixed address 4000, while common fixed bank 3 appears at 6000. We are at 6000. So 6000 in hex, yes, is COO. Um, I think the initial fix is to do that. So that should insert, that should advance to bank three, which will then appear at the appropriate address. Let's try and run it. Well, let's try to look at the code. BFC. No, that's complete garbage. I need to do set lock uh, six thousand. That gonna work? That is also complete garbage. Both hmm. The AGC banking system is kind of weird. Common bank appears as Fixed, fixed address 6000. We are, did I tell it bank 3? I did tell it bank 3. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, block. 
Aha, banks and blocks are different. We want block three, not bank three. The documentation is inconsistent. So block three. It also doesn't help that there are several different models of AGC called uh, block one, block two, etc. So the, this is pretty heavily overloaded and there's still garbage there. Both. Fantastic. Okay, our program is just too big. What can we do to make it smaller? We can make some better code. Because, uh, where is our... Here we go. Comparing equal, we actually... We can replace all this stuff with this. Let's put that here. Is that enough to make a difference? is yeah that's div zero we are we're here we need to scrounge together this much can we make this program smaller somehow we can remove features so this only ever hap this only happened when I tried to make the lights flash. So, but lights flashing is a nice feature. I want lights to flash. We can take these returns out. That will save a little. Not quite enough. We are up to div pwn plus four. No, wait, I think we can. Uh, that's there, then there's return, decimal one. Ooh, that just, just fits. So, yep, that works. Velocity warning, thrust throttle. Okay. So now we are descending very slowly, picking up speed in a ballistic trajectory. And the velocity warning light comes on because we're going too fast. We're at a dangerously high descent speed. If we hit the ground at this speed, we will crash. And I'm not going to bother actually waiting for that to complete. So I'm just going to run that again. Okay, I, as you can tell, I haven't figured out how the banking works. It's complicated. We don't have a particularly big program, but we're using one complete bank. 
Yeah. Um, okay, let us descend, which is in free fall, towards the ground rapidly. Altitude light, and then we crashed. Okay. Can we continue? Yes, we can. I think that's finished. Uh, let's just copy test.cow to lunarlander.cow, add it. Our game occupies every single available word of fixed bank two. This one, everything from 4,000 octal to 6,000 octal. Uh, don't know how to get stuff into block three, but yeah, anyway, we don't need it. Admittedly, there is no space to put anything else in. So I believe that what we now have is the only action game ever written for the Apollo Guidance Computer. I know that somebody did write tic-tac-toe for it. I believe this is the only high-level language compiler for the Apollo Guidance Computer. And I think that this is possibly the only piece of non-trivial code written for the Apollo Guidance Computer for about 40 years. So, uh, that is other than test programs used to verify the uh, uh, verify the CPU on things like the Apollo Guidance Computer Restoration Project. Uh, although I believe they mostly relied on the self-tests inside Colossus and Luminary themselves. So I have a feeling this video is something like 12 hours long. We'll see. But I need to sign off now so that I can rapidly edit it, render it, and upload it to YouTube before Saturday expires. I hope you enjoyed watching this video, even though it took you a week. Please let me know what you think in the comments. Oh, um, and if you happen to have a spare LEM sitting in a basement, uh, or you happen to recover the one in deep space or anything like that, please try my game and let me know what you think. Thank you very much. Links in the comments.